Okay, I'd like to bring the uh, commission meeting to order today. It's August 26, 2019. Uh, Mayor Larry was unavailable for the meeting. Um, so I, Vice Mayor Seidel, will be running today's meeting, which uh, it's Cindy's last day in here, but it's my first day sitting behind this microphone. So let's see if we can uh, make, it, make, make it work great for everybody. So um, with that being called to order, I'd like to invite Ms. T. Rogers up to give her invocation. She's the, a, the uh, humanist chaplain of University of Central Florida. Thank you. And then we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance afterwards. Thank you for the opportunity to offer an invocation on behalf of your atheist, humanist, and other non-religious constituents, and all of those who have chosen to call Winter Park their home. William James said, act as if what you do makes a difference. It does. These are great words to open this reflection. You are here to invest your time today in leadership and in service. You represent people who count on you to act on their behalf fairly and with compassion and respect for all. Leaders serve everyone, even those who are not like us. So today, let us seek common ground with each other and among all people to build bridges across our differences. Let us recognize and consider all people's needs individually and collectively and uphold each person's dignity. May we be aware of the impact and importance of our actions. May we be passionate and engage intentionally in meaningful discussion and set an example of inclusion and excellence. Today, let this council approach the task before you collaboratively, guided by integrity, and anchored by your commitment as public servants to the well being of others. May you deliberate with wisdom, insight, and impartiality. May you be passionate and remain focused on uplifting others, connecting the community and pursuing the greater good for all of your constituents. Thank you for the difference you make in our community. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, so first off, we have the approval of the agenda. Can I get a motion? So moved. So I'll take the uh, move on my right and the second on my left. Uh, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 OK, and a couple of uh, orders of business here under the mayor's uh, report. Um, Cindy, if you could please join me down here at the uh, um, um, microphone. We have a little proclamation here. Uh, well, just before getting into the uh, before getting into the proclamation here, okay, got it. I was turning it off, huh? All right, no, thank you. Um, you know, Cindy's been here since I, I started on the utility advisory board. She's been a great asset to the city, and uh, she also likes the same football team as I do, so we get along very well. And uh, gonna miss talking to her on Mondays about what happens during the season this year. So, but with that, I have a uh, proclamation uh, put together for uh, Cindy Bonham Day here at the uh, city. So, uh, September, si which will be September 6, 2019. Correct, Randy? That's correct. All right, so it's not today, it's in a couple weeks here. Whereas Cindy Bonham was born in Baltimore, Maryland, and lived in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, as well as Northern Virginia, before relocating to Florida in 1991, and whereas, in the, early 19, in the early 70s, Bonham began a 20-year career with the Central Intelligence Agency in Langley, Virginia, where she began her career as city clerk with the, Winter, uh, the city of Winter Park on July 24, 2000, and where she ran flawless elections and transitioned city ordinances, resolutions, paper records, and minutes to electronic, making these records easily accessible and searchable, and whereas she earned her Master Municipal Clerk designation in 2012 after years of attending training courses, and whereas the city celebrates Cindy Bonham's career and wishes her well in her retirement as she enjoys spending more time with her daughter and identical twin grandsons. Now, therefore, I, Greg Seidel, former Mayor Steve Larry, by virtue of the authority invested in me as Mayor of the City, Vice Mayor of the City of Winter Park, uh, do hereby proclaim Friday, September 6, 2019, to be Cindy Bonham Day in the city of Winter Park, Florida. 
Thank, Thank you, you, Cindy. Cindy, if you'd like to say a few words now, we do have another group to come up to talk. Do you want to say something now or are you going to wait until they talk? Okay, let's hear what you got. Um, um, could you please give your name and address? <laughs> Cindy Bonham, retired city clerk. No. Well, um, I came here 19 years ago and had no idea what to expect. And it turned out to be quite a journey. Sorry. Crap. I told myself I was not going to do well, this. Just, just think of Daryl Green's Hall of Fame. <laughs> Am I going to cry? Darn straight I'm going to cry. All right. OK. Anyway, um, you know, I, I came here, and I just want to say I have been so proud to work here for the city of Winter Park. You know, it's, it's an amazing city. It has so many amazing people. And I've made a lot of friends. Um, a lot of, you know, gosh, my coworkers, just citizens of this city, I've gotten close to quite a few of them. And I'm gonna miss everyone, but I'm going on to my next chapter in life, whatever holds. Um, I just, couple things just wish that um, or hope that my next 19 years go a little slower <laughs> yeah anyway I want to be standing here and not somewhere else <laughs> and um, you know I just um, you know I'll be around I, I you know I want to come if you need help Randy I've told you I'm here <laughs> well Randy <laughs> you know, I love you, Carolyn, but geez, <laughs> enough is enough. No kidding. <laughs> anyway, no, it, it's been it's been a great ride. You know, it just has. I'm I'm very blessed. I'm very thankful for everyone and all the support I've I've gotten throughout the years, and everybody's just been truly great. And you know, and you know, I want to say some good things about our staff. You know, our staff is they're amazing people. And they're very smart. They know what they're doing. My boss is amazing. He's I wouldn't want his job for any amount of money in the world. He he does a great job and he looks out for all of us. You know, we've been a great team all these years. And thank you guys for, you know, always being there and getting your agenda items in on time. Well, most of you, anyway. We know, we know who she's talking about. Yeah, we, they know who I'm talking about. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's been great. And um, I just thank you. You know, I, I, I'm very blessed. And I just thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. And now we have uh, Pat from the Florida Association of City Clerks to come up and say a few words. And, and then we'll invite your family up for photos. Oh, OK. Yep. Uh-oh. <laughs> the speaker's on. You don't have to touch it. OK, them. thank you. Good afternoon, members of the commission, staff, and all of those present. Uh, my name is Patricia Burke, and I am with the Florida Association of City Clerks, and I am the Central East District Director. Also with me this afternoon is Maria Waltrip and Kathy Sitaro from the City of Maitland, and Tracy Ackroyd from the City of Claremont. I am here today to uh, congratulate Cindy Bonham, Master Municipal Clerk, on her retirement. Cindy, I know you have served your city with dedication and professionalism. I am sure your journey as a city clerk has been filled with challenges and rewards, but because of your dedicated service, nothing could stop you. Your replacement will have some very large shoes to fill, and there's no crying in the clerk's office. <laughs> I commend you for your 26 years of hard work, perseverance, and municipal service, 19 of those years which were with the city of Winter Park. I know that you are looking forward to a well-deserved retirement, and I hope you have some wonderful and exciting adventures planned. At this time, I would like to take a moment and read Florida Association of City Clerks Resolution 2019-03. 
A resolution of the Florida Association of City Clerks expressing gratitude and recognition of Cindy Bonham for seven years of service as city clerk for the city of Oviedo and 19 years of service and dedication as a city clerk to the city of Winter Park, Florida. Whereas, Cindy Bonham has worked for the city of Oviedo as their city clerk for seven years and for the city of Winter Park for 19 years as their city clerk. And whereas, Cindy Bonham has, had an active, has been an active participant in the Florida Association of City Clerks for 25 years while receiving the designation of Master Municipal Clerk in 2012, serving on the Bylaws and Manuals Revision Committee, and volunteering at the Florida League of Cities Conference booth on more than one occasion. Whereas, Cindy Bonham has carried out the duties and responsibilities of the city clerks of the city clerk in her capacity to the best of her abilities, utilizing and sharing her knowledge and expertise, which was enhanced by her participation in FACC through its conferences and educational seminars. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Florida Association of City Clerks, Section 1. The Florida Association of City Clerks offers its sincere appreciation and extends best wishes on behalf of all of its members to Cindy Bonham in recognition of her retirement after 25 years of dedicated service and professionalism in representing the office of the city clerk. Section 2. This resolution will take effect immediately upon adoption and authentication by signatures of the president and president-elect of the Florida Association of City Clerks presented this 26th day of August 2019, it says the 28th, but the 26th day of August 2019, B. Meeks, Florida Association President, and Deborah Buff, President-elect, Florida Association of City Clerks. Again, on behalf of the Florida Association of City Clerks, the Central East District, thank you for your service and dedication and enjoy your retirement to the fullest. And if we could all get a picture, that would be. I like. I like to say just one more thing. Oh. If I can. Sure. I think I'll allow that today. <laughs> there's, there's, there's one other thing that I'm looking forward to, probably very high on my list, and that is not being the last one to leave this commission chamber on Monday nights. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to get the proclamation? Yes, we have. Yeah, you want to come on. That would be awesome. Thank you. You want to hold on your hard work? Yeah. <laughs> you guys want to come up and we'll do something in front? Yeah. Yep, let's get the commission. Greg, can we ask you to do that? Can you do it with your grandbaby? <laughs>
Here's your. Uh, yes. Yes, I am. But before he leaves, we can also thank Supervisor of Elections Bill Cowles for being here for this momentous occasion. The mayor's report never took so long, Mr. Vice Mayor. Well, you know, now, I got half now I've got half the people leaving. <laughs> it's like, uh, no, very nice, and we'll, we'll all miss Cindy. She did a great job, and uh, we wish her well. And a, uh, a long, long retirement as she's seeking. So, uh, the next item is item five: the citizen budget comments. And this is uh, we don't need to read anything at this time, Randy. Nope. And then, um, is there a spot where we're going to discuss our? Yes, we have budget okay. discussion later on the agenda. Okay, okay. Okay, so we'll open the floor to any comments on the budget. Uh, this is not public comment period for anything. This is comments strictly pertaining to the budget. Do we have any going once, going twice? We have one? Okay. All right, fantastic. No. Okay, this is about the uh, overall budget for the city, is what the public... Carolyn was nodding yes. Later? <laughs> is it, if it's for the budget, then yes. She's, yes. she's here to make a Yes, budget. absolutely. No worries, take your time. Debbie Komansky, I'm the executive director of the Alpin Palachet Museum here in Winter Park. I've been in this position for almost 17 years now. I was born and grew up here in Winter Park, and it's been a true love to be able to serve the city in a lot of different ways, as well as take care of the museum. I appreciate the opportunity to just thank you for consideration of our request. Uh, we very much need it, um, as I think you're all very well aware of the lack of funding coming in and state grants and other things. And I just want to um, point out a few things that we'll find. Peter? Does this work? Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Are, are you gonna need more than the three minutes? Or? No, I'll be very quick. Okay. I just want no to say how proud the museum is to have been a partner with the city on the completion of this city hall in 1964. Mr. Palaszczuk gifted the city with the statue out front of Forest Idol. In 1984, we also... Sure, which button? Okay. Uh, in 1984, we gifted the Emily Fountain that is in Central Park. Currently on very long-term loan, man carving his own destiny at the library, and um, working with Randy and staff about placing some additional sculptures in the new library when it's completed. We are very aggressive in our uh, very aggressive in our programming to serve the citizens. We feature the permanent residents, historical um, history of Alpin Palashik and the gardens. But in our gallery building, we do four separate exhibits every year to serve Winter Park citizens and give them something that they can come back to on a regular basis and enjoy. I think that uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to help us continue preserving the life and legacy of a great sculptor. And I appreciate any of the help that you can give us to continue to make that happen. Any questions? Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Commander. Hello, everyone. Uh, Sabrina Burnett, Winter Park Public Library. We come before you today for some extra consideration. And like Debbie, wanted to say thank you so much 
um, for your continued support of the library with an annual operating increase. This year we are asking for special assistance with a project that we've taken on for the new library. So we need to update our existing, um, we call it an integrated library system, but it's essentially our inventory management and patron database system. So it's the backbone of the library. We have to pay an annual fee, which we've already, we're going to pay in that fiscal year. So um, we're seeking assistance with the onboarding project cost for the new platform so that we don't have to pay twice in one year. And this is something that we would be using in the new library and it would enable us to do some of the new things we've anticipated, such as our new roaming model of service and introducing some new equipment and things so we can do things the 21st century way in the new library. That was all. Any questions about that? What's the value? 56,000. And it's just one time because we can cover the annual cost going forward. It's actually an IT request. Yes. It's going to be technology. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is LaShonda Lovett. I am the Executive Director of the Winter Park Housing Authority. Which button? Is it this way? Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you um, about who we are and what we do. The Housing Authority of the City of Winter Park was actually created by the city back in 1970. And our mission basically is to provide affordable housing and access to um, resources so that our residents can become more self-sufficient and independent. We have a um, board of directors that's made up of six wonderful staff members. WPHA staff is made up of basically three individuals, myself, a, de a deputy director, a resident service coordinator, and then the properties are managed by um, Allied Orion Group. Since our inception, we have acquired six properties. Two of them are dedicated to the elderly disabled families. That would be Tranquil Terrace and the Plymouth Apartments. We service about 700 families in total. I'm here to speak with you about the Plymouth Apartments, which um, 196 individuals who are elderly and disabled called home. And they are all over the age of 62. The demographics of these families is as follows. The average income is about 18,000. Um, their sources of income are primarily social security, pension, and some of them are employed. And the average rent is about $613 that we collect for each unit. The annual utility expense um, for the Plymouth is about $300,000. And after the debt service, this is the largest expense of this property. Here are some of the capital improvements that we are challenged with when it comes to um, the Plymouth Apartments. In 2015, the chiller was replaced and along with remediation, it cost the property about $2 million. The next um, project that we're looking at is the roof replacement, which is estimated at about $450,000. How can you help? I am here on behalf of the 196 elderly disabled families that call the Plymouth home to ask for the $25,000 in the city's general fund. This will be a start in assisting us with our utilities and capital needs. Thank you again. Here's my contact information if you have any further questions or concerns. Okay, thank you. Any other budget comments at this time? Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the next is the uh, city manager's report. Randy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, just a reminder, of course, we're in the middle of hurricane season, and of course we have a, a storm that's brewing out there that has its sights on, the, on Florida. We'll, we don't know yet where it's going to be, but later in this week we should know. I want to remind the residents out there that we have these pamphlets available. Uh, for hurricane preparedness, as well as a reminder to stalk us on Facebook for the city manager emergency page uh, that we'll use for getting updates out if, you know, if this storm does take a track that's going to impact this area. Uh, also, as Cindy left, but I just wanted to add in publicly my thanks for, for her years of service. She's, it's, been a, it's been great to have someone in that position that uh, knew what they were doing, kept us out of trouble, especially when it came to elections and public records, so I just wanted to say that thank you. And with that, I want to turn it over to our illustrious Parks Director to uh, give a presentation that you asked for at the last meeting about the summer program, Jason Seeley. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon. 
So we wanted to come in, come in today and give you guys an update. Our Parks Recreation Department just completed another great summer of uh, programming with our the, the two big main focuses being summer camp, obviously, and our aquatics programming. Um, as you'll see here, our summer camp program had it was a 10-week program, 150 kids per week, and that equaled out to about 7, 000, over 7,000 visits, visits over the summer of our K through 6 uh, uh, campers. Over 200 of those uh, children were residents um, out of the 238 unique enrollments. So that's about 75% of our, our uh, participation is resident participants at the community center. Um, as far as the uh, summer camp goes, we try to provide a diverse, uh, diverse programming. So uh, we work with the, uh, a lot of our community partners. You see the Winter Park Playhouse, the fire department, the police department. Um, as, well, as well as uh, UCF and the library. Um, these, without these great community partners, we'd be, uh, not, we would not be able to offer such a great program for our kids. Our summer camp, when we think summer camp, we think K through sixth grade. Our summer camp program, though, goes all the way through 12th grade. We offer opportunities for those kids that age out, grades that going into seventh, or so rather, uh, eighth or ninth grade through 12th grade, the opportunity to uh, participate in our junior counselor program. This year we had 26 participants um, and they've completed roughly 5,000 hours of volunteer service that goes towards scholarship programs and other things. And additionally, we had the Student Youth Enrichment Program, which was a, is a partnership with our CRA folks. And we had three students this year um, that participated at the community center within the Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, lastly, with our summer camp, we always try to make sure that we get evaluations out to our participants. This year we sent out roughly 200 evaluations of that, we received 81 back. Um, and you can see, see from the results, we have about 75% of our uh, evaluations come back at 75%, or sorry, at excellent, about 20% good, with the remaining being adequate, nothing in the poor range. Next part of summer camp, of our summer programming, is our uh, aquatics programming. We offer aquatics at both Katie Way Pool and the Community Center. And you'll see that we had about 6,000 visits at Katie Way, 4,000 visits at the Community Center Pool. And then also, we, um, uh, summer camps are a very big part of our, uh, summer of our programming at both pools. And you can see that we had about uh, five to 6,000 6, camp visitors as well that brought in roughly $23,000 in revenue. Instructional, um, instructional aquatic programming, 18 group swim lessons over the course of the 10-week summer with 118 students going through the classes and going on to the next level along with 65 infant students completing the course, completing courses uh, in, uh, with uh, adding up to about 2,000 hours of instructional um, work. Lastly, our competitive clubs and our swim teams. We have 200 competitive swimmers working out of the uh, Katie Way pool, uh, 52 Special Olympic athletes combined for 50,000 50, training hours over this course of the summertime. And then all last but not least, we, do also our, our, we also try to have some community events each summer. And you can see that we had roughly 200 participants at each one of our events, the dive-in movie, the splash into summer, and our back-to-school uh, back event at the, in August. And then lastly, you guys have, um, you should have in front of you something from our, a memory book or yearbook. That's very good. That was uh, our, each year our, our campers tried to come up with a little project, and this year that was their project. They made a little yearbook for their summer camp experience, so we wanted you guys to have a, a copy of that as well. So we'd like to thank, we thank you for the support that you guys provide, and uh, it's, a, it's a great offering for the, pro the community as far as this, the summer camp and the uh, aquatics programming. So thank you. Any thank questions? You. Thank you. Yes, I did have one question because I was at the pool the other day. The uh, the heating for Katie Way Pool is that's that's being both, both wells are I believe are in. We're still on on target for the end of September, so it should be transitioned right from from. There should be no fall off as far as the Great. pool goes. Great, fantastic. Yep, fantastic. We, Thank you. We have hot water at Katie Way in the showers now. No, not yet. Not yet. yet. That's next. Well, that's the next. That's step. The we got hot water in the pool, good. so we're we're getting there. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. I would like us to bring that back up when we talk about budget, the hot water at the Katie Way pool for the showers. That concludes my report. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Okay, I had just one uh, question for you, Randy, and then we'll see if there's any others. But the, um, there's a few emails going on about the Orange Avenue project um, that I saw. 
And I just kind of want to do um, just clarify where we're at and what the next steps are. And um, which which Orange Avenue project are you talking about? The the, uh, the traffic issue. The traffic calming oh, traffic. section. So so we got the final report from the FDOT. Staff is going through it now, and we'll be working with the DOT on next steps. I believe the recommendations out of that report were to prevent left turns both east and west off of, out of Westchester during the afternoon rush hour, basically. Uh, and then there was one other recommendation I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, but we're but okay. We're, is that and I guess what I was trying to get clarified too is that a short term is the no right turn, and then they had the other document that they put together about. Um, I believe it showed the roadway diet, Troy. Is that, I don't know if that's still on the table or is that not on the table? That's kind of what my question was. That one, they're looking to see if they can get safety funding to work through because it'll be very expensive. And so they're, they're working through that process. The DOT does. Okay, okay, thank you. We got a report, I'm sorry, I can't remember who it came from, that we got the report that was for Corinne Drive. Okay, does that go anywhere here? Do we respond to that in any way? Was that just a courtesy to provide it to us or what's the story? It, it was just a courtesy to provide to us since it's just outside of our jurisdiction. We don't, we don't have a, an, an active role. If we have a comment about any of it, you know, certainly we can make those, those comments. Staff's been somewhat involved throughout the process giving input uh, on, on what our preferences are, but but yeah, that is their Metro Plan's final report of what they're recommending. And now it's just a matter of, can the city of Orlando and Orange County fund the project? And they're not asking the city of Winter Park for any funding for their, their project? They have not made that ask yet. I don't expect that to be an ask. Okay, I just would like at some point for us to make that available because so many people in the city of Winter Park use Corinne Drive. So. I, even though we all know it's not in the city proper, it would be very nice for us to be able to respond with some sense of, of that. So I don't know what we do with that. I just wanted to make sure that we make it available or in some form or fashion to other people. Okay. Um, Randy, I had a couple of questions. The first one is, um, can we seek regulatory um, direction that the post office has to use for uh, disposing of their property. I have not been able to find anything, so I'm hoping that maybe you or Kurt, I don't know if that's something you might be able to get your hands on, but I would like to understand what their restrictions are, and I've been unsuccessful in getting that. Um, and the second one is part of um, the Florida League of Cities last week was um, to have Governor DeSantis speak, and he was very encouraging in the way of water quality projects. Um, also, the settlement, the Volkswagen settlement, um, Florida's going to get $166 million that can be invested in transit. So that's why I, I keep bringing back up our shuttle bus for Sunrail, and, and I'm hoping that perhaps we can qualify under that. But um, I would like to see our air quality reports for the last five years, whatever we can have, just showing a trend of how our air quality is doing. I was very surprised to see Orange County and Orlando in particular being very high on the um, environmental justice scale. So, th so because of that, it will make it easier for us to get grant funds. That's the good news. The, the not so good news is that's not a good scale to be high on. So I'd kind of like to look at that if we could. Okay. Um, thank you. I'm assuming we got three nods there. All right, thank you. Mr. Weaver, anything? No, thank you. Sir, you're good? Good. All right, so uh, the next item is the city attorney's report and um, I don't know if you have anything new to add, but then we'll talk about the, uh, the trees. I think just a brief, a brief recap of, of what we talked about during the workshop session on the Arbor, or, or Arbor statute um, and, and how that's proceeding. It's, it's my understanding that um, Drew Dennison is going to uh, 
take the first stab at uh, modifications to our Arbor Code provisions, uh, soliciting input from our various uh, committees and, or uh, boards, and uh, that you all as a commission would like uh, for us on the legal side to work with her because of the risk of, li uh, of liability to the city in, in uh, potentially going beyond what the statute means. And, and the primary reason for that is uh, there's a lawsuit going on, as I think you all are aware, by Pensacola that has sued a property owner to be able to uh, stop that property owner from cutting down a championed live oak tree on that property owner's vacant parcel. When I think the city takes a position there, it's, it's not dangerous. Uh, there's been uh, uh, um, briefs filed in that suit. I understand there's a hearing today, so we're monitoring that. I've spoken to the League of Cities. League of Cities uh, does not intend to intervene in that case as an amicus. Uh, the league is not aware of any other case statewide that's pending, um, except for that one in Pensacola. Um, the thought also is that if the city makes changes to the city's arbor ordinance, that we would like to be as aggressive as we can, understanding that there there is the risk that we could get into a challenge uh, and the potential for attorney's fees if we are challenged. However. Uh, I think we've got some very good arguments that the attorney's fee provision does not apply. So when there's a preemption by the state to, uh, in an area like this, um, if there is express preemption or, or, the, or our ability to regulate that has been preempted by the state, then um, there is some, some significant risk. However, we also have the, the argument that, one, there's no express preemption in that statute, and number two, uh, that it, there is an express exemption under that statute that says if, if our code provisions on our trees was adopted pursuant to Chapter 166, the Land Development Code regulations, then we're also exempt. So we think we've got some good protections. But uh, with the Commission's blessing, we'll work with uh, Drew uh, and the staff to come up with uh, ordinance to bring back to you uh, to carry out uh, as aggressive a continued monitoring as we can. I think one thing that Drew wants to, would like the commission to address today is whether the staff should reinstitute permitting uh, of uh, the removal of trees or substantial limbs to those trees because uh, staff has not been uh, permitting those since the adoption of this ordinance because of the concern um, and risk to, to the city. So uh, a lot of local governments around the state did that. Uh, just stop uh, requiring those tree permits. Um, our suggestion is that uh, with care we should reinstitute those, but I'll let her address that, and it's really up to the commission to give direction on that. Okay, thank you, Kurt. Um, do we have any comments on what he said, or, or I can tell you where I wanted to go with it at the moment. Didn't we come up to the decision the last time we discussed that, that less than 10 percent of the ask were were really in, at issue. I mean, this was a rule we had in place for nobody practically. It didn't it didn't come into play. Is that not what we decided when we looked at all the statistics last time around? I I'll be happy to comment. I think when we looked at the statistics, excuse me, we did see that uh, only about seven percent were rejected. Um, and I think Drew has some information about that. Of course, that was before the statute was plastered all over the news media, which um, I, uh, the statute very clearly only applies to trees that present a danger. So that means we have exceptions in our code. So trees that present a danger would become just an additional exemption. We don't have to start, stop, uh, implementing our code and, and I think did you say that other cities that had stopped have now reinstituted their codes that's correct yeah well that from my personal perspective that is absolutely the way I would like to see the city of Winter Park go I want to be very respectful of the law and you can um, discuss how we might uh, change our code to incorporate that additional exception um, Commissioner, if I could here, the, um, the meeting we had earlier, well, we discussed the new tree law and, and our current tree ordinance, and the two things that came out of the meeting was that we feel we don't have any reason not to continue to enforce our current tree rules within the city. 
And so we wanted the commission to all get together and say, yes, we agree. There's no reason not to continue to enforce our current tree laws. And then with the condition of the danger trees, um, that they were going to investigate ways to have a post-mortem that the people that sign off on those trees turn um, something in. And so the advice that it sounded like Kurt had given us earlier was these things can be done, but we need to be careful how, they, how we do them. So with regards to the lifting the suspension of tree permits, we wanted to go ahead and do that and then let Drew and uh, Mr. Arderman figure out the best way to address the danger tree issue in the short term from just getting documentation or something. Um, so that's, that's what, that, that was the outcome of our earlier uh, meeting. So the first thing I'd like to do is get the commission to all agree or discuss that we go ahead and reinforce our current tree policy and our tree permit. Um, I just wanted to make uh, one minor point to um, Commissioner Sprinkle that all of this only applies to residential properties. So uh, commercial is off the table. I understand do you need that. A motion, or do we? How do we so, have so I'd, let me, I'd like let me, to have some discussion. And can I be really clear on it first? Mm -hmm. So, what I read when I look at the law that was passed, okay, is not the interpretation you are giving us now is different than the interpretation we got earlier. Is that not correct? No, I don't think. I mean, why did we stop? Um, I wasn't involved in, in the decision to stop. I think Randy, I think Dan Langley and Randy and staff talked about it and they, there was a decision. Be, well, here's the problem. If the statute's not clear. And because of that, we are at risk as a city, as is other, every other local government. So, so if you want to be safe, you stop. You just don't do it. If so every step beyond that, because right now, if you get a landscape architect or an arborist that's licensed, they say it's a danger, then boom, they could cut the tree down with no permit, no fee, no review by the city. So given, given where we are at this point is, and the, the lower risk of getting uh, assessed attorney's fees in the event there's a challenge, the direction that we're suggesting is that if move, move, forward, move forward with as much enforcement as we can, but it's going to be a balance. I mean, if, if we define dangerous trees to be trees that uh, uh, are, are only happen, that will fall down or be there only in a hurricane, then uh, that just about every tree, uh, I mean, you have to be, you have to, you walk through a definition of dangerous, you walk through a definition of what is the documentation, you walk through a definition of residential and notice, right now we don't know and nobody does and that's the subject of the litigation. So we're going to take a position where it's going to be a judgment call on, on all these permits and applications that come in that Drew or the, or the city staff is going to have to make. So it's not if they make the wrong decision and we get sued over that, then we're going to be in court over that. So, Kurt, could you share why you thought this law came into effect, the situation yeah, that sure. got this law passed? So, as I understand it, after Hurricane Irma, there was a uh, property owner where they had a tree overhanging their home. They tried to get a permit from the local government to take it down. It was either not issued timely or was expensive. Uh, there was a lot of problems, and, and it blew up. The, uh, I don't know what ultimately happened with that particular person, but it became uh, a real problem. So that initiated this. So as I understand it, the intent of this legislation is to protect, uh, I'm sorry, is to allow the removal of trees that present a real threat to someone's uh, residential home or their property. But that's not the way it was written. It was not written... Uh, carefully, in my opinion, at all, it exposes all local governments to, to great risk when it should not. So rather than wait on the legislature to come back and fix it, it's, it's good. right now we've got one case in, in Pensacola. We as a city, I think, have the opportunity to say, look, we're going to, the legislature didn't define these things, we're going to do it, we'll define that, and then we're going to continue to to impose this when there's a true in, in, uh, uh, a real risk to a property owner, a residential property owner, then we'll say, okay. 
The problem is, which comes first? How do we even get to review that? So the statute was poorly crafted, both procedurally and definitionally, and it's, it's, it's created problems that we're now willing, I think, as a staff and as the lawyers for the city to recommend moving forward with care. That's, what, that's where we are. And um, from my assessment of this, it clearly says that it only applies to trees that are a danger. And interestingly enough, a danger is not a term of art that are, that's used by an arborist. So we have the opportunity to go in and say, okay, we're gonna create an exception and we are not gonna require permits for trees that are dangerous. And oh, by the way, this is a clear professional definition of danger. So what this ordinance did was it only applied to dangerous trees, that's it. So in reality, what it says is that we can continue to operate the way we have always been operating for any tree unless it is truly declared a danger. So we want to implement the law. We want to include the law in our codes and very clearly define a process to make sure that we're honoring the intent and the word of the law and we are continuing to protect our tree canopy. So I, I, and I, I really feel confident we can do both and I'm hearing from the attorneys we can do both. Did, and I'm, okay, so I agree, except I have a whole nother take on why this law was passed, okay? Sure. I've also heard a whole nother story on why this law was passed and it wasn't about a dangerous tree. It was about the cities perhaps having too much to say about a person's tree on their own property. So you have to accept the fact that that's also out there. Now, Agreed. at some point, we as a city made the decision to make a change. And now we're wishy-washy folks, we're changing back. And that's what I don't appreciate and that's what I don't wanna do. The, the, the legislature's meeting in January. They're gonna be addressing this again. I just don't want us to look like we're changing things because of this or because of that. And I, I understand, I want, this isn't about the tree canopy, it's about how we do business, okay? So for some reason, we all sat up here and agreed a few months ago on the recommendation from people to do it this way, and now we're taking that back. And I have a little hard time with that. Well, um, if I may. Yeah. I'm curious from our city manager. Uh, about new information know. came to light, and I understand what you're saying, but um, you know, uh, it's taken a little time for our city attorney to uh, look into it, and the fact that there's a lawsuit, you know, specifically challenging the law, I think it's you know, it's a reasonable turn of events. Lawsuit hasn't been finalized yet. It just got filed and maybe was heard today. I would much rather wait till we have the results of that lawsuit, and then you've got a reason to make a change. My, just filing a lawsuit to me isn't the reason to make the change. I, I just don't want us to be back here, and changing back is what I don't want us to be doing. And right. I think we have that possibility if we do it too soon. But we initially, st I, and you'll have to help me, Drew. Um, why did we stop requiring permits? Because there was nothing in the law that would have led me to believe that was the proper thing to do. I was given direction from city management. We, and did, well, sure. Because I don't remember having an agenda item where we had information, where we had the documentation and the case studies and the write-ups from even where the there, where there were no case studies, it had just happened. I mean, the right. statute. So we really just didn't have any information. We had, we, we had it was trying to be cautious. Attorneys all over the state were advising their cities to okay. to discontinue it, and, and so that's and, and in consultation with our city attorney staff, that's what we decided was the safe route to take. Uh, we've had a couple of months now of of different reactions around the state, and and uh, you know we think a reasonable thing. I mean, it's not unreasonable to say if you have a healthy tree, you still need a permit. So right. that's that's sure. that's where we are. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was like a moratorium. We've had moratoriums before where we had to get more information before we were ready to move forward. Actually, well, there, there was more to it, Carolyn, because yeah. we decided we were going to go send this back to a committee and we were going to 
increase the rules that we were making on people's landscape plans. So this is not something we didn't discuss. Yeah, we all Sarah, sat up here and if, talked about it. If I could, the meeting we, we had earlier, we discussed that, and it was there yeah, was sorry. nothing about putting more, more rules on people. No. There was going back and reevaluating our current rules and see if we're achieving our goal of having a high quality urban forest. And, and so that's what we're looking to do. Right. right. So, so that's what we're looking to do. And so Drew is doing that currently um, with staff. And then the intent is for once that is complete, she's going to share that with the other boards, Planning and Zoning Board, Economic Development Board, and the uh, uh, Sustainability Board, and whatever other boards are appropriate. She'll get the comments collected together and then bring it back to us and present what she thinks the changes to the ordinance. and ought to be and but in the meantime though that it was to try to figure out if there's anything can be done from the danger tree perspective is more of a post-mortem and not a you have to check with us but we we as a city who have all our trees in GIS you know we should be knowing which trees are being taken down and so they need to submit something so we can keep our urban forestry count correct and and so that for me is that's what I've asked them to look at in the short term um, why this rule plays itself out. But in, in the meantime, there's nothing with the current rule that's going to get us in any trouble if we require people to get the same tree permits that we've always um, required. But in the meantime, we should be looking at our tree permit process to see if there's ways to improve it all around. So, so um, do you, are you looking for nods or do you need I'm just a looking for, right, or? just nods here that we're all okay. in agreement because this wasn't right. really a commission action before that, you know, we're directing the city manager that, you know, we're comfortable with him not, not, or right. enforcing this rule and, and lifting the suspension and, and that um, we move forward on the other items, but it would somewhat be business as usual in my mind. And then if people have these danger trees, they're welcome to get an arborist to say it's a danger tree and get it cut down without letting us know. But then on the other side of that, I was hoping we could get some kind of information from them just to let us know what trees have been taken down. That's all. So defining a process, defining the terms will be very helpful in implementing the law. And, and we understand there is some risk here. We've been advised by the city attorney. So uh, we're trying to make the, the best mountain we can here. I'm very comfortable. Any more discussion? Anything else for Kurt? All right, fantastic. We'll, we'll move ahead to the uh, um, the financial reports. Number eight is the, is the next non-action item. Presentation from Wes. Thank you. Got a financial report here for you. It's got the highlights for the first nine months, nine months into the fiscal year. Start with the only um, not so good news in the whole report, and that's our communication services tax. That is a tax on uh, cable and satellite TV, landlines, cell phone lines. Um, internet service is exempt. Sales of internet service is not taxable, uh, subject to this tax. And the way providers bundle these things and have uh, caused the um, revenue to kind of, as you see it, decline. We think we're going to be about $300,000 short of our budget there. Fiscal 18, we got a, you see it, it looks um, like a good year, but that includes about a $296,000 audit adjustment we got from the Department of Revenue for, had to do with taxes related to previous years. So as a catch up, one time receipt, if you take that away, the bar looks more like uh, what we're projecting for the current year. Wes, are these taxes that they're not billing anymore for, or they're getting to keep them and not pass them on to us? They would not be billing them. So anything they, in taxes, they, they're required to bill them, and they um, go to the state, and then the state um, goes by an address database that we work with and that's how they determine what jurisdiction the tax goes to and that's also how the providers determine what tax tax rate to use for the, in each customer does that include the 911 service no i don't think so yeah it, this is as, as wes said the problem is the bundling you know now you get the 49.95 all internet access and people use that for their telephone and everything else 
those taxes aren't on that. And, and so, you know, the, the way they bundled the cell phones, all these different things is less and less has been taxable. We know anyway, anyone in here will say our cell phone bill hasn't gone down any in the last 10 years. It's only gone up. But the amount that's taxable continues to go down. Right. right, lots of people get the, um, you know, their uh, high-speed internet and their um, cable on the same bill. So this is a um, communication services tax has been anticipated to continue to decline. So we kind of have a feel for how much it's going to go down. So it went down significantly more than we anticipated. Is that that's correct? Point? Right. And they're trying to find a replacement revenue for this. Is that not to my knowledge? No. no. Okay. no. Right. So there's not much of a lobby so for perhaps, local governments. Out perhaps there, uh, for the internet cities. commerce taxation. Maybe. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, construction activity still going very strong. Um, that rightmost line is a projection of where we think we will be for fiscal 19 and then you can see that's almost as high as fiscal 18. Fiscal 17 was really high. Um, you know, we got some new legislation to deal with here as far as how much of a carry forward balance we can carry. So we're um, examining our fees there and that'll be part of what we bring to you for a future meeting. I'm B sorry, I'm not building, building permit, fit, excuse me, building permit fees, as you know, can only be used for the enforcement of the Florida Building Code. And so when we collect more than we use to, right to do that, we have to, we have to carry that forward and use it in a future year for enforcement of the Florida Building Code in a year where there's not as many permit fees. The new legislation has restricted the amount you can carry forward. Uh -huh. And so, not when, the time period. Right. So, when we do our fee schedule, you're going to see a proposed reduction in our building permit fees because of we, we can't continue to carry as much as we've got carry it forward. They do it as a percentage. The the biggest part, the big dollars of these fees are based on the estimated construction value. So, if somebody comes in uh, and they've got like the um, Rollins Dormitory, I think that was about a thirty-three million dollar project. So. That gets a, a, a it comes out, works out to a very large fee. But I think her question is: Is it a oh. percentage you can carry forward? Oh, um, or is it dollars? Uh, it's dollars based on what you spend. I think you can carry a year's worth of av your average spending for the past four years, or something like that. I'm not certain on that, but it's something along those lines. Can we use it for inspectors? Because I'm, oh, I'm yes. I constantly get calls from people saying. Yeah, I'm waiting for the Winter Park inspector. So maybe before we reduce all our fees, we might want to add an inspector. <laughs> Just a thought. That's a that's a certainly a legitimate use. Outsource that so it doesn't have to have long-term benefits. But if that fluctuates, maybe there's a way to spend some of it instead of giving it back. It's an idea. Right. Um, investment earnings, you know, you can, if you look at that, uh, it swings all over the place. It's a, it comprises both interest earnings that we receive as well as changes in market value. Changes in market value are what drive the wild fluctuations here. So you see for fiscal 18, we were in a rising interest rate environment at that time, and so we the negative, uh, the unrealized loss that was in our portfolio at that time uh, drove, took away all the interest earnings and brought it very close to zero. And now in the current year, as we are um, seeing declining interest rates in the market, the values of our um, fixed rate portfolio appreciate. They look better. They look more attractive. So people are willing, were, would be willing to pay more for them. So it's, um, it's an unrealized loss gains in the current year. And also as um, securities get closer to their maturity date, they also appreciate to their par value. So if you got a million dollar bond, it's going to be worth a million dollars at its maturity date. 
golf course. I um, made a little mistake in the report that I put together. I was a little optimistic in the revenue projections that I had in there. I said it would be about $215,000 greater than estimate. I um, didn't adequately take into consideration that summer months are a little bit, they don't get the same level of play as the more comfortable fall and spring days do. So uh, I think we'll be about $150,000 better than our, our budget estimate. It'll still be a very good year for the golf course, but that nice margin between revenues and expenses will tighten up uh, as the year round nears completion. And how much total have we invested in the golf course in the last three years? I'm not sure offhand on that. You know, the main, the big improvement we did was about a 1.2 million. I think we spent a little more than that. But, and I uh, think we spent 90000 this past year, so. Okay. So you think we're under $2 million? Oh, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just I played Saturday. It was nice. Yeah, it was I shot nice. well. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we ended fiscal 18 with a general fund, unassigned fund balance, which we generally refer to as reserves. Of about 13 and a half million. I think we're going to be somewhere around 14.3 million at the end of 930 uh, or about 26 and a half percent. Water and sewer I, fund. I have a quick question sure. on that, if you'll go back to it. Is there any requirement that you, we just mentioned the requirement that you uh, uh, can't carry forward, you know, a percentage of carry forward? Is there any requirement? that anybody else has on us uh, we've always been aiming towards 30 percent in this do we is there any requirement about what you can or cannot carry forward i don't think i can't think of any limitation on how much you can carry forward in unrestricted fund balance there there are other restricted revenues that have to be used for certain purposes like the gasoline tax can only be used for transportation that that type of thing Right. If you wanted to carry forward, you know, if you wanted 50 percent, you could. It's, it's just limited by what we dream up. Okay. Some cities are at 100 percent or better. Not many. No. <laughs> I haven't no. seen any. And I'm not sure that's a good idea. But. Water and sewer operations are looking very good. We um, have very strong bottom line there. It's quite comparable to the prior, where we were last year at this point, around $1.4 million. 225 debt service coverage is very good, and 125 is the minimum. In electric, we think we're going to be very close to our annual target for kilowatt hour sales. Our bottom line there, um, we think we, you know, these July, August, September, this, uh, the negative you see there for the net change uh, for the nine months should, should come closer to even. So I think uh, we'll look very good there and very good debt service coverage wise too. Our cash balance will not be as pretty. Um, we have some large receivables outstanding that um, we probably will not collect by 930. Uh, we have about 755,000 outstanding with FEMA and the state that's related to Hurricane Irma recovery efforts. Um, we've also incurred about a million dollars in cost on our Fairbanks project that we built, will bill to FDOT, so that may not be in by September 30, since uh, that's not very far away. Um, also, we recently, a couple of weeks ago, we made a payment to Duke Energy of about $530,000 as part of our agreement for buying service territory in Bravadash. So that will be um, a cash drain. It'll be a future investment in revenues. We'll have the ongoing revenues in the, that customer base from now on. Um, there will be future payments uh, that we have to make to Duke as part of that agreement um, as well. But like I say, that will be, um, we'll get the benefit of the future revenues there. As you may recall, that, that agreement called for us paying two and a half times gross revenue for each new customer that's picked up in Ravidage that would have been Duke customers. Right, two and a half times their revenues for their first 12 months. So is Ravidage building out as rapidly as you projected when you made that decision? 
to make that investment. When we made that decision. <laughs> I, I'd have to go back and look at the original projections, but, but uh, you know, the mix is a lot different than we originally projected. Yeah. You know, we don't have near, near the Nearest office bases. Right, right. I, I noticed that um, your little write-up talked about the uh, decorative lighting. Do we have a lot more requests from neighborhoods than we're able to satisfy? Dan will better be able to understand that, but I he's, think we've he's had not in his head yet. I noticed you mentioned it, so I just wondered if there was, uh, is this an ongoing problem or is this challenge, opportunity? It's a waiting list, right? There is a waiting list, okay. So if how much money would you need to be able to do what people are asking you to do? You know, is that? So, so and, are we, and are so we the, waiting a long time? I mean, are people waiting a well, long So the time? challenge is... I mean, it's exciting. You know, they participate in that, right? They pay back. They do, but we, we front the money, yeah. and then they pay it back over time. For 30 time, years right? or something. Or is it... It's not 30 years, is it? Well, well, it's not well, that long. Uh, okay. it, it's more like... 10. Yeah. More like 10. Yeah. Okay. I would be interested in seeing how many, how many things are in that queue, because that might be a place where we could we could make a difference if we could accelerate that just because nobody wants to get in a queue, so to speak, and be, speak and be in a waiting list if we can help it. I would just go back to the, um, just emphasize our poor cash position in the electric fund. Just to say, yeah, we say that. <laughs> but we did just move a million dollars in there, didn't we? Uh, that's year. been two, three years ago, yes. Felt so like yesterday, Irma, it feels like yesterday. But, but Wes, and, uh, you know, my question is more of if we get another hurricane coming through here, we, you know, what's our cash options? Because last time, I, you know, Dave, Dave Zussi wasn't happy with our cash options. Is that where we're heading if we get another hurricane? Sure. We, have, we operate under what's called a pooled cash system. We, we would front the money out of the, the other operating funds to, to cover the, the storm. It would be paid back over time. Yes. But we got all those portable generators, right? We already bought them? Okay. Isn't that not one reason we have a 25%? I mean, that's why it's there, people. It's not there just to say you got it. It's that's, there that, to That's use exactly it. right. So that's all I've got. Well, well, that's kind of a Dan West question, but I mean, if you tell me we spent a million dollars worth of work on Fairbanks, that's a million dollars worth of undergrounding that's happening in and around the city, but not part of our undergrounding. Are we? Right. It's not in our service territory. So those are actually Duke customers. Well, some are ours, right? Like the ones right adjacent to the road, and then the ones behind. Our no, all of all of that is. All of that is Duke. Some of it's distribution, okay. some of it's transmission. So that technically the transmission is serving us uh, that we're putting underground, but it's not, it's okay. not going to a customer directly. It's not it's something the residents would see as us making progress right. in their plan. That's correct. So, it's in the That's correct. is it causing us to have to slip your schedule for getting the undergrounding done? Okay, thank you. <coughs> Anything else for uh, Wes? Thank you. Yes. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. All right. Um, so citizen comments will be at five o'clock. It's four forty-three. Um, so let's just move forward with the uh, consent agenda item number ten. I'll move it. Like, like to pull C two. Is there any other, any other areas we'd like to pull before we yes. move it? Yes, 10C2. Yes. Okay. Sarah, are you I'll, okay? I'll second. Okay. All right, so with that one pulled, um, we will vote for the remaining consent agenda. 
and then we'll citizen just, comment. It's citizen comment on the uh, the other items on the consent agenda. That would be all all items except for 10C2. Seeing no comments. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Now the um, 10C2. Let's have some discussion. This is um, for the resource officers at the schools, and and I noticed that. Um, I'm sure Glen Ridge and Maitland Middle, uh, since they're middle schools, are probably um, the most important places. I'm assuming those are in Orlando's budget and in Maitland's budget, but I just wanted to confirm we do have resource officers that, that, in the middle correct. schools. That is correct. Perfect. And, and I don't know if everybody knows this, but our police department stepped up and, and the city of Winter Park provided resource officers way before anybody insisted that they do so or figure out how they were going to be paid because they knew it was the right thing to do. And I just want to say thank you to Randy and thank you to Chief Deal about that. And, and I would move to approve C2. I had a quick question. Um, I do noticed. Do we that have a second first, or? I'll second. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Weaver. Thank you. Um, I noticed that some of the resource officers, um, the billing rate was 49k, and then for Orange Tech, it was 72k. Is that because of the hours? Thank you. That's all. Okay, any uh, public comment on item 10C2? Right. Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. <laughs> uh, next item is uh, item 11, uh, the discussion of the potential fiscal year 20 budget. And uh, we'll do public comments after that if it doesn't uh, too long, thank you. True. So, what I'm passing down is the spreadsheet, I believe, that was in your packet. Yeah. Yeah, Peter's still not as old as I am, so he hasn't learned I need bigger print. Either that or we need an older budget officer. I'm not sure which. That's right. Can I get a clarifying question answered? We had a, a parent yes. who called us or sent us an email about a child who was struck at the corner of Audubon when they were going to Audubon Elementary School. Do we um, have crossing guards still for Brookshire on Lake Mont? I know we have one at Lake Mont on Lake Mont. Do we have crossing guards anywhere for Audubon Park in Winter Park? We, we do not have any crossing guards for Audubon Park because that, that Corrine crossing is in Orlando's jurisdiction. Do and they have a crossing guard? Yes, they do. So the, the child can cross the big road Corrine with a crossing guard. The only place they could not cross would be if they were crossing Old Winter Park Road. Is that correct? If, if they're crossing Winter Park Road before they get to the city limits, that's correct. If they get it, if they go all the way down to Corrine, I believe that crossing guard would cross them either either direction. If they if they go all the way to Corrine before they try to cross Winter Park Road, we still have a crossing guard for Brookshire on yes. Lake Mont too, right? Okay. Thank you. People have, have comment on this before we get into the discussion, Randy. Yeah. Would you like Peter to walk you through what's on the spreadsheet here? Give you an update. This is this includes all the okay. comments that we received from city commissioners, as well as some staff recommendations that have, based on information that we've gotten since July 1st when the budget was presented. All right. Exactly. All right. Let's hear from Peter. Thank you. All right. Well, the good news is I do think my eyesight's going, so maybe next year this will be slightly larger print, so I apologize, yes. Uh, so what we've got is we've got commission comments that we've received. Those were in that, in that matrix. We've also put in anything that was sort of new data since we presented the budget to you in July. 
Um, obviously, first off, off the bat, the state revenue estimates are provided by the state of Florida every year. We make our best guess going into that process. Uh, however, we typically, if we see a large delta between what we had estimated and what they come out with, we typically request an amendment to their numbers. Uh, so the, the long story short on that was uh, we were too conservative on sales tax and too bullish on communication services tax, as you've also seen from Wes's presentation. They pretty much net out pretty close. If you adopt the state estimates, all four that we have listed in your budget uh, packet here, you're up about $107,000. The uh, school resource officer section, this has to do with the good work of PD negotiating their deal with the county. We're going to end up about a net 50K ahead as part of the agreement that I believe you all just passed. We had mentioned in the presentation to the commission about cybersecurity. Uh, in fact, I think Texas just got 23 cities were just hit actually by a mass ransomware attack. This is becoming an increasing concern. Uh, I know IT and management have been talking about um, looking at adding additional personnel to try and address that issue, and that was sort of a, a late addition as we were looking through the budget process. And so we Peter, think the next excuse me. Um, do yes, you have an overhead for the audience to review this? We do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Now you can squint along with us. <laughs> the good we, news is they can blow yours up, so you can actually read them. People, people want to blow my stuff up all the time. <laughs> I would just appreciate as you go along if you would talk about the um, the net change, like the 107 minus the 85 now, which is how the and if the dollars are general fund dollars, and that's okay. But if they are general fund dollars, I'd like to know. Because when I add this up, I have more apps than I have dollars. So. I think between what we get and depending on which commission um, items we look at, because I think there were a lot where we'd have to do a little more investigation or study on what those price impacts would be, um, but ones that have clearly uh, been defined that would affect the general fund, such as the uh, cybersecurity at 85. Um, I look, think we have some parks items for 10K for uh, weeds at Mead uh, and the library request at 56K. Um, we're netting out pretty flat with the net ups and the net downs because you're going to pick up about $157,000 between the PD item and taking the state revenue estimates and then you're going to lose 85 plus 56 plus 10. You're going to get pretty close to net where we already were. So before you and before you get away from the school officers are you telling me that we're going to make money on that deal no because this that's is what it, no this is just over what we originally budgeted so it's, it, it is the same right okay. we're, we're, we're getting more we're getting, more, we're getting more per officer than we got in prior years and we budgeted more closely than what we got in prior years so we this is a wash i just want to make sure okay that's what i was talking about because i don't know what Sure. So in your contingency budget right now, you have $931,000. That's currently made up of $319,000, which is, uh, by policy, that's that half of 1% of revenues in the general fund. You've got $316,000, which is the placeholder for commuter rail, which in some past years the commission has decided to reallocate towards other, other projects or initiatives. Uh, and then you have uh, $296,000 in what we would call surplus contingency right now that we provided in the proposed budget to address things as they would come along. So that, that 296 is really what we have to go and is, talk about. Right, 296 plus or minus whatever you're adding if you adopt the state estimates or not. It's probably the primary variable. Uh, water and wastewater interlocal, we just received from the South Seminole and North Orange County Wastewater Tree, uh, Transmission Authority their updated estimates for what we transfer from our water utility, so it's non-general fund, non -general fund dollars, um, to them for processing our wastewater. Uh, Randy, my understanding is that number's a lot higher this year because of new capital projects that they're bringing online. That, that's correct. So when we brought our budget for the wastewater forward, we had about $190,000 contingency in there. Uh, we had estimated we were probably going to get an increase. We just weren't sure what it was. We are suggesting that all of that, well, I mean, it's in our local agreement we have to, is going to be used for that uh, project. No, it was contingency no. for the entire water and sewer fund. We're using it all, mm -hmm. which we typically don't provide a contingency in our water and sewer fund. Because we have a healthy carry forward fund balance. Correct. Did we increase it last year, the rates? 
Uh, uh, rates were, did we flatten it? I think, I believe we did make the PSC increase to rates this current year. We are proposing it in this year's budget as well. Uh, if you did not use the PSC suggested rate increase, we would have to find about $675,000 for the water utility. So it's a big, it's, that's a big chunk for them. Uh, as you heard from the Palachuk Museum and then also from the Housing Authority, um, I believe also uh, Commissioner Cooper brought forward the Palachuk item as well in her list. Uh, you also heard their presentations as well. Um, the pool of funds that we provide, the $350,000, is about what it comes to for fiscal FY20 for outside operating support. Uh, we do have $23,000 left in that. We're suggesting uh, that you could uh, afford what the Palachuk is asking through that. Uh, and then regarding the Housing Authority, um, you do have the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and it has adequate funding that could be used uh, to support this purpose. It would fall within that parameter. That number surprised me just a little bit. Um, have we stopped collecting? Uh, do we have a moratorium yes. on collecting affordable housing yeah, fees? Yes, you still have the ordinance, but you set the fee at zero. The reason that number grew from 400000 to 600000 was the mandated contribution to affordable housing from Ravidage. Uh, got it. Okay. Um, just for a future item, can we look at some um, options about things that we can and cannot do with that money? I'd like to see us putting it to good use Certainly. for affordable housing if we can. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, Peter. And I believe that's it for the staff suggested changes to the budget. So uh, when you're all finished, what's your net on take and put? So in general fund, we're going to be up 15, 22. You'll be up 72 if you adopt the cybersecurity and you adopt the police and you adopt the state revenue estimates. So we get 72 more to deal with? Uh, to the general fund. Thank you. <laughs> that was for you to spend, I think, on your line item. I knew I should have brought my calculator up to the desk. My place. 72K. We got 72K to talk about. Any more questions on the staff side, or can I transition to commission items? Um, you know, Peter, just from the, um, you know, what you put here today is kind of your update of what, is what's going on with staff. And it kind of seemed that some of these, um, you know, are we going to go light item by light item and say yes, yes, yes? Or, we, okay, so, so do we want to go through Peter's? items right now before he well I think we should see everything on the table before we go through that because okay. I don't want and I, I and is cyber security the $85,000 is that just like a good number or where did that come from we're estimating that based on what the position starting rate would be plus benefits cost that's an addition of one full-time position so you're talking about hiring somebody else yes that's correct No, we don't want to add any more manpower, but in that area, I'm not sure it would make sense to be farming that out. I don't know how comfortable. I don't know how another person's going to stop at that anyway, from what I understand, so I don't know. I think, think we need it, but I don't know if it's going to be a person. Is that how they're stopping it? Well, absolutely. I mean, the, the, amount, the amount of time we currently spend, we, we, we have an employee already dedicated almost full time to this. And so the amount of time we spend going through, and, and it's, it's above my head, right? When we're talking about this kind of stuff, but I mean, going through this, the, the different spam blockers, making sure every, every protection software is up to date on a daily basis. And I mean, it's, it's all of that type of thing. You know, when, a, when they push a new fix through for a specific software, making sure that gets loaded right away because there's some threat that they found in that software. So it's a daily, occurrence of going through all those softwares and making sure all of our protections are in place. The number of threats they stop on a daily basis is unreal. It's in the th tens of thousands. Yeah, sir, I could just, our business, we didn't add folks, we hired folks on to handle it because because the threats are out there. So doing something, doing something is right, right. And, and what's the right thing to do for us, it was to outsource. I understand the need for it, and it's still, we can't stop this one person who keeps getting through, can we? <laughs> okay. All right, so um, what I'm hearing then is that we'll go through all of them, then we'll come back and have a discussion, go line item by line item. 
Yeah, and then, uh, Todd, you want to have a, a short recess, just for a few minutes? Um, can you can you step away and come back? Or okay. Um, in the meantime, we'll just we'll keep um, kind of talking about Sarah, what you got here. And you want me to do it, or is he going to do it? I, I'm happy to do it either way. If, if okay, the commissioners right. suggest, would like to yeah, bring with us uh, Peter's time. advice, we let Peter talk through it, talk okay. through the impacts, and you can add. Explain what I think, but. Okay. okay. Yeah, Peter, you just want to read through them and we'll add comment as we see fit. Sure. Um, Commissioner Sprinkle, we'll, we'll get to the ones that you submitted. Uh, this first is for weeds at Mead Gardens. This was to provide funding to address weeding issues at the gardens. Uh, my understanding is we do have some funding that's set aside. It's pending approval of the lease agreement, a final approval with uh, Mead Botanical Gardens on that. Um, however, to address some of those immediate issues, Parks is estimating about $10,000 to add that to their maintenance budget as part of weed remediation out there at the site. So let me tell you why it's here and why I don't think it should be here, okay? In the past, we've had people that were dedicated to doing that and they mowed and they edged and they weeded and now we've taken it and we are farming it out to a company and they edge and they mow, they don't weed. Well, weeding is necessary in Florida and so I just think that it's something that should have been in that original contract and maybe it was an oversight or whatever. So to put it here and to take it out of that little bit of money we have puts it in a kind of a tough spot because that's something that we've been doing as a city and we need to keep doing as a city. If we need to take it out of this money, it's better than not taking it, but it should be in the upkeep of, of that from Parks and Rec for me. So Sarah, this is just for the main areas that they mow, not like the areas down by the trail where the wetland is and everything. It's, right? it's what they do on their contract basis. So that's the, I, I just brought it forward because when I was there, I saw the weeds. And if you're going to be having a wedding over there or wherever you're doing, you don't want weeds sticking up. So that's why it's happening because <coughs> the guys that do my yard mow, edge, and weed. And that's a very common thing. So Our contract for the new people does not include weeding. So have we um, spoken to Mead Gardens or we're in charge of this contract? Because this is kind of one we, of those we have, we have spoken with Mead Gardens and, and Commissioner Sprinkle's correct. It should have been part of the contract. It, it wasn't, this is adding it back. We're still saving money over when we did it in house. So, but this should have been, and it would have been part of the base budget. It would have been $10,000 higher had we done it before. So this, this would get us where we, where we need to be. Is there a reason why staff would prefer it to be folded into the um, discussions of the lease agreement? I noticed you said you were waiting for the lease agreement. Yeah, is this, would it be nice to have this not, uh, not included until after the lease agreement or as part of the lease agreement? Or I just don't know what you're negotiating. We're, we're continuing. Issues are. Well, there's a lot of issues. We're continuing right. to work no, with I, I with that. with me to try to to try to come up with new agreement. We're looking at different ways, whether it should be a lease agreement or a lease agreement and an operating agreement. Uh, and there's there's issues uh, they're working through with the city attorney also on some of the language. So it's it's been difficult to get that to the finish line. And so this is a temporary. Fix. I haven't seen Meads. Um, operating budget in a long time, so I don't really understand where the money that we give them goes. Um, I'm fine with this if it's something that we need to do, but if staff would like to, to hold it as part of the lease agreement, I'm fine with that too. I, yeah. I would not be in favor of keep it, tying the lease agreement with this at all. This is simply how we keep that park up. That's all it is. And we are in the past, we have kept it up with weeding, mowing and edging. We need to move forward doing the same thing. It's just that we didn't put it in the the contract with the people that we hired to do it. Okay, so this is more of not how we're spending the money, but that we are spending the money, correct? Okay. All right, and so uh, let's, let's move on to the next item there, sir. All right, the next item is the uh, library uh, card system that Sabrina came and spoke about at the dais earlier under budget comments. It's the $56,000. Uh, as a one-time contribution uh, in addition to our operating support this year to help fund that expense. I ask that be put in because it's a big ticket item for one year to go into a, somebody's budget and it, from an IT standpoint to be ready for a move and to be ready to, to continue to stay in, on top of this. They need that new system in place. And I would rather it be a line item. This one does belong in the line item as opposed 
opposed to just increasing the budget and asking them to try to work it out. Because this is a kind of a technology increase, much like we did when we did the ERP <laughs> and other things that we've done here <coughs> at this table. So I'd like us to look at it in that line. Peter, do we know if this system um, has periodic updates that are billable? Um, I, I'd like to know if it is a truly a one-time thing because data management systems that I've used, you know, we have to upgrade them quite often and sometimes yearly. From, from city support standpoint, what we're just asking for is to fund the one-time capital. So we also give them operating support every year, so they would have to accommodate those kind of needs as part of that out of their operating budget. Um, but certainly Sabrina can answer any of the technical questions about the actual system. Well, that, that's a good answer. So is this, a, um, this is part of the responsibility we're going to take over anyway at the new library? Are we going to take over all their IT things? I haven't gotten a clear understanding of that yet. We, we haven't finalized all those details, but the, the, the software that's specific to the library, they would still be responsible for the, the cost. Uh, we, we're going to manage from an IT standpoint the, the uh, system. Okay, hey, next. We're currently up 6K commission. <laughs> uh, the, uh, if all these things are approved. Right, so correct. there's nothing left? Yeah. Okay. Well, remember you do have the two, remember you do have the 296 that is the original excess contingency. Um, Commissioner Sprinkle uh, mentioned the MLK Park plan and asked that we'd like to see plans on rehabilitation of the Martin Luther King Park. Um, staff has commented the Parks Department is currently looking at the previous plan scope. Uh, the intention is to come back to uh, you guys and then also you guys as the CRA agency and discuss uh, what sort of a low, medium, and high um, look at various options that that park would be. Strategic planning session in January. I think that's where we're headed. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Uh, and then, Commissioner, you mentioned a drainage plan for the city, uh, that you'd like to see a drain plan for the city uh, where we might have issues. Um, at the CRA uh, agency meeting in July, we did allocate that $350,000 to start master planning stormwater retention in the CRA area. Um, <laughs> staff is saying that's probably a good first starting point to, to look at this. Uh, Commissioner Seidel, I know you had some similar comments under your commission items that you submitted. Uh, so I think staff is still saying that our, our best bet is to, to approach it through the CRA funding first and then evaluate as, as we kind of explore that. Any further technical questions, you'll have to answer the stormwater ex expert. <laughs> but it won't tie your hands. You're going you're gonna to follow it we're to gonna, its we're logical gonna be, absolutely. Yep. need. Okay. Uh, and then Commissioner Sprinkle, you mentioned parks and rec bike path and green spaces plan, that you'd like to see a parks and rec plan that includes green spaces and bike paths. And uh, I believe this is already being rolled into the overall transportation master plan being performed by the planning and public works departments. And how much money is allocated for that right now? Uh, right now, that'd have to be handled out of their operating budgets that they've got in those areas. It's also something CRA funding could address depending on your location. Um, I believe planning has about $80,000 in their contractual services account for next fiscal year. As well as this is an in-house function of the new transportation planner that you approve. Yes, thank you. Remembering, I didn't approve a new transportation planner. I just approved the budget that said you're the one that decided it was a new transportation planner. All right? And that's great. I'm delighted you decided to do that. Especially if he comes up with a good plan for connecting green spaces and bike paths. Uh, next, uh, Commissioner Cooper, we've moved on to your items. Uh, the Palaszczuk Museum request, the 23000 we discussed that. Um, it's not in here twice, though. You have it for 25 and she's got it for 20, oh, 23 sorry. Yes, we were just showing that staff had received the, the request and how we could accommodate that. And, yeah. Okay, you'll, what you'll see is that um, you and I and Greg, we all have asked for the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Cooper, you also mentioned the stormwater master plan beyond the CRA area, and our, our comment was still the same on that one that we yeah, could I just wanted to make sure that we can get over to the road. We're not leaving anything behind, right? Um, Commissioner Cooper, you mentioned the corridor traffic model for uh, beyond uh, parts of the CRA, um, and that the CRA budgeted 100K and FY20. 
I don't believe we specifically designated that. I think Commissioner uh, Seidel had mentioned that that was about what he thought something like that would cost. We do have $200,000 in the CRA budget for contractual services in general. And since this is 1792, you certainly have been storing away uh, quite a bit of funding for that FDOT partnership project. So if you wanted to explore this sooner, we have the funding available in the CRA to do that. Uh, and then Commissioner Cooper, you also have the 1792 uh, improvements that would also be outside of the CRA area. Uh, and and there's a, I think there's a, a couple ways of looking at this. You know, we don't know the timing of when that project is going to start for sure, so it's certainly something we can accommodate in the general fund CIP as we get close to that date. I mean, we could still be three years out, four years out. Next year, should we be in a position to plug it in where it belongs? Is that nothing's going to happen before then, I assume? Second, the end of the year. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, that's certainly a way we can look at that. There's also ways where you could look at um, total project cost would also involve in-kind services from the general fund, and so that's kind of what we did for Denning. So CRA dollars were used for materials that got deployed throughout the entire strip, even though some of that was outside of the CRA, and in-kind services as a contribution to the general fund could be looked at. So there's some ways that we can look and at And when funding. you do that, you create a <laughs> create developer an agreement kind of with Between the city and the CRA. Thank you. Peter, excuse me just a yes, second. Sir. I wanted to ask um, Greg a question here. Would, do you see any clash between us doing a, a traffic model of 1792 and what FDOT is currently undertaking? Um, no, I don't because the I've, we've gotten, um, Randy and I met with the current consultant project manager that's doing the FDOT work and they're doing the modeling for the FDOT on, on their portion. And so what we're trying to do is have them supplement their model with the city portion and then the city would contribute what we need to contribute. And so it's so they know what's going on because that contact who's a consultant, they'd be it, it would work done through the DOT, but we're providing funds for them to do the city portion. And really what we want to be looking at within the model is is not just get the model up to know what the, what's going on, but then what improvements can they put in the model? And that's where kind of at the moment, I think we have an estimate to put together the existing um, model, which I forwarded to Randy and uh, Bronce, but we haven't had a chance to sit down and go back through that. And, and again, I hate to say we're waiting for the transportation planner to get involved, but, but that's kind of, you know, that's, um, th that's what the intent is. And then the follow-up to that is, you know, we really can't start construction until I-4 is done. Um, they're not gonna do, they're not gonna do work on 1792 I-4 is going on. So the, the, and then, you know, I would real, feel really bad if we went out to Fairbanks right after we open up Fairbanks and do some more work on it. So there's some timing things here, but the intent is how can we um, uh, work with the DOT and uh, plug to the chamber here. They're having the, the, the luncheon where um, the FDOT IT guru is gonna be at that chamber luncheon so we can ask him questions and you guys can find out what the DOT is doing specifically and how we can work together as they always say, we're not here by ourselves, how to work together to get these things done. So this is to help you know, add some funds to that and we really won't know projects or project costs until that modeling is done and then we make the uh, decisions as to what we wanna do and there can be several options and different costs and we can as a commission can decide well we're willing to chip in this and the DOT may have funds available also once that's done but we, we won't know that until that modeling is complete. Thank you. Uh, uh, did you remove the 113.750 then for a later date or is it still in there for a consideration? The 1792. Uh, I, think what I think what I'm hearing them say is that um, those were actually the, the mast arms, I think, at those two intersections. That was what that value was. And I think what they're saying is that's not going to happen in this next year. Is that Correct. fair to? Yes. So we're, not, yeah. we're saying not so that did, this year. Not, Correct. Okay. It's not coming out of our positive six that we have so far. <laughs> All right, the next item, uh, Commissioner Cooper, was transportation impact fee for commercial development. We stated Winter Park does not collect transportation impact fees or multimodal fees for impacts of new development on our roads or multimodal facilities. Uh, staff's comment was that review of this impact fee could be considered as part of the work being done on a mobility fee. The county-led effort also to uh, look at a uh, one-cent sales tax would also maybe impact this consideration because that would be funding that's dedicated solely for transportation. 
I, ho I hope we're going to help some in educating people about what that's going to mean to us if it passes. Yes, Clar Clarissa is working with their uh, communications team to... Oh, good. To Cause you know, and, and I know everybody up here, all we hear about is traffic congestion. And I know that Penny's going to go for so many other things, but I think the thing that people pick up the phone about is traffic congestion. So hopefully we can... Yeah. Mayor Demings has a presentation that I, I saw the other day on it. If you haven't had a chance to see his presentation, um, I suggest you next time we'd see him. Um, actually, it's going to be an ongoing thing. He's going to have yeah. multiple um, yeah. town halls that you can attend, and the League of Women Voters is uh, intimately involved in that, too. And some of those town halls will be in Winter Park, so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next item, uh, Commissioner Cooper, you submitted was establish commercial uh, parks usage or impact fee. And you said that the comprehensive plan policy requires only development to pay its fair share of costs to acquire new parks, and that we currently only assess that on residential properties in excess of 10 units. Um, I can is read. Is that still valid? Peter, is that still valid? I, I, Are we gosh. only collecting on, you know, it's been a while. And I, I know Dory made numerous changes. We had, I don't know if we lost that. It's, it's still there, I believe. Yeah, I don't know. yeah it's still collecting okay. on, on re new residential you. units. Thank you. Uh, every year, do we have a, a bound money that we get for that yearly? I, I, I think the number, and and Bronson, you correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's five thousand dollars per new net new residential unit. Is oh, it's two thousand. Jeff's saying it's two thousand. All right. <laughs> Two thousand dollars for net new residential unit. Is it only? Is it only for over ten units, or is it every net new unit? Wonderful. So, so the purpose of this recommendation is to say that it's not just our single-family residents that are using our parks. If you go out there any time during the day, people who work in downtown Winter Park are enjoying these same parks like we are. And this actually came as um, an original recommendation from the WRT study that they did a few years ago. Um, and one of the suggestions that she made was that perhaps we start to assess a fee on our commercial properties also. So that's what I've been trying to bring to the attention of the commission for numerous years, just quietly, subtly putting it in here, hoping you'll think about it. Um, but I would like for us to think about, and I'll ask at the end of the meeting, whether we're willing to have three nods to ask, um, to have this looked at and analyzed. So that's all about that. Um, Commissioner Cooper, could you, um, do you have any ideas on how that would be um, scheduled? You know, unit size per square foot or? You know, I can find some examples that we could look at, some samples of the way other people do it. I assumed that it would be done the same way we do our residential, which is by the unit, but, but that may not make sense for commercial. So let me, yeah, I can try to bring something back about that. But I think my issue was just bringing the awareness up to say, is that something that we want to pursue? And if we do, then I would ask staff to bring us back different options and examples. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, our parks are assets for any commercial property, so you got my nod on that. You, you don't have my nod on that. God. You didn't have it last year either. <laughs> and you'll never get it on that one. <laughs> it's all right. I understand. All right. well, I understand. Here's, but, a, here's what I would offer up, though, is that and when we do this, this greenways and you know, um, park and rec, bike path and green spaces, that's going to require some funding. So we need to figure out what the options are. And if you know, if the one cent sales tax you're talking about, if we can get money from the county for that, you know, let's let's look at those options. But I don't think we kind of look at, you know, if we're going to look at funding, let's make it for something, and then figure out the best way to 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 get it. And that could be one of the things place things that's available, but let's wait because there may be some alternatives that the developers could do also. So. 
and, and, and Sarah, when we get to actually having this conversation, I am very interested in, in understanding how you feel and why you feel that way. Um, and, and perhaps, um, you know, perhaps there's a place in the middle somewhere where we could come down. But I, I think that part of my frustration is that this begs a plan, and we don't have one, and we haven't had one, and we have to get a plan before we can go ask people to fund it. That is exactly what I heard Greg just say, right. and that's I know what you say because you because that's what you. you right. I well, think because we all the poor parts the boys thing, tried to get the money yeah, for a master think, plan for years, you know. Yeah, I think we're all saying the same thing. I just want the plan first before I go ask people to fund something. I don't think that with the one cent that's for transportation that's going on in the county right now that this is a good time to go hit people with another something. That's just that's just what I think. This is, this is applied just to new commercial development. You know? I, I okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next, apologies. Uh, the next item Commissioner Cooper had was regarding uh, new vehicle purchases being upgraded to electric vehicles. Um, staff's comment is that we we do look into this. This is this is interesting. This is something that we've been possibly exploring with the building department because we have the restricted building funds to be able to do that easily. Um, the issue has more to do with the feasibility of the types of equipment that we have. So we, you know, sedans have, have done that transition fairly well, but heavier trucks and things like that, certainly construction equipment, those are areas we're continuing to look at. Diesel the technology. engines would be a good year to look at diesel engines, given the Volkswagen settlement. But um, my, my question about that is how many passenger vehicles are we buying in this budget? I believe we're doing 14 replacements this year. But the majority of that is cop cars, which I think are now in SUV format. Okay. I believe that's 10 of them. I can get that for you confirmed. OK. So we're only talking about four cars. And are any of those four well, in they, the building department? Some of those may be a heavy construction equipment. No, we're, we're currently not replacing any of the building ones, um, at least proposed for our, our fleet replacement this year. But okay. it's certainly something that if so, we wanted to look so at. So if I part. felt strongly about us starting to convert to electric vehicles, and um, can you give me a number of what that upgrade would cost that's not in this budget? Yes, we can take a look at that and come back to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. But aren't we going to make a decision today? Well, you can still make budget amendments. What, what, the decisions you make today, we will factor into the budget ordinance that you consider at first reading on, uh, at the next meeting. But you okay. can still make budget adjustments at either of those two Okay, meetings. I just didn't want to lose the opportunity to try to do something. Sure, I think from a regard. staff standpoint, we're always trying to look at how we can do that. You know, sedans, those are certainly a, a more right. likely well, area. Typically, it's about a 5K about toggle per car for something like right. that. Okay. Um, but that's something we can get with fleet and see. Do we have any electric vehicles now that are owned by the city? Yes, we have a couple. Um, I believe we have, is it two in the building department? Or one? And they're, they're in the building department? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, yep. I can't hear you, Peter. Uh, yes, sorry, sorry. There's, I believe there's two in the building department. And that's because we have dedicated funding there that right. it's available, mm -hmm. okay. I, I like to talk about this a little bit more. So I've been researching this and the city right now, just our city vehicles use 200,000 gallons of diesel and gasoline every year. And if you look at the greenhouse gases, just from our small city fleet, um, this is a big deal. And you know, we're talking about saving our tree canopy. They're the lungs of our world. Um, this is a good way to um, augment that. And uh, four years ago when we um, adopted our sustainability action plan, this was part of it. And um, things have changed. Tesla now makes a $40,000 four-door sedan. Um, we're not in Riverside County. This is a very small city. Um, there's really no reason that 50% of our vehicles can't be changed over fairly quickly and economically. It's not, you know, the sticker shock just isn't there anymore. And when you factor in the maintenance costs and the fuel costs, it's a bargain. And the payback is very quick, just a couple of years. And, you know, we're talking about getting our city on um, equipped with vehicle chargers. This is a good way to do it. And um, so, like I said, they, there are multiple cities now that are using Model 3 police cars, 
And if you got a you know a bar fight to break up and you need you know the the big SUV, um, you know we can get on the radio and do that. But um, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, Commissioner Cooper talked about the shuttle from the train station around Park Avenue and so forth. Uh, Bluebird, who makes um, school buses, they have a hundred orders for electric school buses now. So you know these things are scaling up. Uh, both in volume and size. A uh, local company I used to work for, Q's, they make electric camera inspection trucks now um, that have solar panels. They're run entirely on batteries. And the technology's here, and, and we should capitalize on it. It's a savings in the long run. This isn't a, um, a net loss of revenue here. I completely concur. And the Volkswagen settlement has $116 million worth of um, grants that are going to be available. And uh, the governor has said he is looking for partnership. So I would love for Winter Park to be part of that partnership. So, so somehow, before we're finished with this discussion, I'd love to have a dollar value that is possible to apply to this line item so that we can vote on it. Thank you. It, well, um, Commissioner, if I could just add here, again, this sounds like something that would be a complete transition plan and set a goal for electronic vehicles, and I don't think dropping it on Peter right now to come up with this plan in five minutes and give it back to us is... But Peter's well, a smart but, guy. <laughs> Peter's a really smart guy. What if we just but said we want up. four of these vehicles to <laughs> be electric right. or alternative well, vehicles? Well, I'm guessing, what I'm guessing is, knowing how Peter and the city has operated, there's probably a few other vehicles out there that should be replaced that he's not replacing that we're trying to maintain and get through another year without having to buy some more vehicles. So there may be some other vehicles that could be added if you wanted to do this, but that would be some additional cost. So but I think what we'd like to be able to do is get back with our fleet manager and look at, because we also got things like the learning curve, retraining, how much we can transition all at once and, and try and get our own in-house techs on board with that. Uh, so there's going to be a lot that's involved in that. So it makes me a little nervous to say I'm going to give you a number for this upcoming budget year. Um, I would suggest if you're amenable to it, let's explore it through the building department first because that's the easiest way to go after it. And if you wanted to make a mid-year amendment or we wanted to explore this two months later, we can come back with a transition plan. We can do that. It's difficult to do. And, I mean, we can, we can get you a number for what out of our current replacements could be electric. Um, well, a lot of times we get numbers for things with that we don't have firm plans of how we're going to do. So from my perspective, um, unless we have money in the budget, it's not going to be able to happen. I mean, you know, it just, it's not going to happen. And, and I do think this is a direction the city should be moving toward. I am not of the um, opinion that, that I need to say 50% by a certain going at all but I'm going if you're gonna buy 14 vehicles why couldn't one or two of them be alternative fuels okay we'll come back I don't need that. a big plan for that okay uh, one other comment there um, you know last year or two years ago I remember the Commission approved eight new police cars and with the adjective interceptor and you know we're a nine square mile city and um, about all you can do is accelerate fast with a with a police car and almost any electric vehicle now will out accelerate any interceptor um, ICE engine so I, that's that's not a selling point anymore either <laughs> ICE just means internal combustion engine yeah yeah but I, I just uh, I just added this note real quick and then but Peter I would also think from our parks and our maintenance that getting electric equipment in the parks is now they have electric mowers they have all kinds of electric equipment you can use that's just as efficient as the just as strong as the gas and so it, I don't know how much of that we've looked into in that department either but to me that would be a part of it as well so um, um, while you're talking about that um, I was briefly talking yeah, I was talking to our <laughs> sustainability people about leaf blowers. So we've had a lot of citizen comments about the noise, but um, most leaf blowers are two-stroke engines, and they require a lot of maintenance. They put out a lot of smoke. They burn oil, and they're obnoxious. And um, I have an electric leaf blower, and I absolutely love it. It's battery-powered, 
And um, Jason, I, I guess he's not here anymore. Oh, hi. Yeah, I, I would like to have a meeting with you because we'd like to have a trial um, to see how a couple of your blowers could be. Okay, do you know what brand they Good are? Good answer. Tent? Um, I'm not okay. sure. Okay, no worries. All right, thank you. Okay, next item, please. Sure, the next item is a circulator shuttle from Commissioner Cooper. It's add a circulator vehicle to move residents and visitors between Sunrail shopping areas and other areas of interest, pursue grants from state, complies with Sunrail Task Force and Kimley Horn recommendations. Uh, certainly we can begin to look into to grant opportunities. Certainly it will be an electric shuttle. Uh, but, uh, and then it's even more exciting, that's right. Um, and then also, of course, we made a comment that this is, of course, an eligible thing under the, the county-led uh, effort to pass the one cent sales tax. And then also your CRA would be able to do this within the CRA district. Um, however, we are pointing out that we did recently allocate our cash reserves and contingency at our most recent agency meeting for the CRA. So this would have to be considered for future years or we'd have to amend the current CRA budget. So all that to say, yes, we can do it? We can absolutely look into it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been hearing that. I think I sat on the Sunrail Task Force on Transportation with Deidre McNabb a decade ago, and we all agreed and voted at that point in time that to have Sunrail without a circulator vehicle for that last mile type of movement um, was not uh, the best we could do for our residents. Uh, it's fine for people who come and they only want to go to Park Avenue, but you know, I think we're a lot bigger than Park Avenue now. And we're talking about Orange Avenue, we're talking about Winter Park Village, we're talking about Florida Hospital, we're talking about Rollins, where, you know, there, it just seems like we could do better. Yeah, I, I think there's some opportunities there. Well, so uh, it, it, when you're talking about there's CRA funds available, but I also think there's opportunities, and he was kind of joking about the automated vehicle, but they're doing tests now. Yeah, and like if we doing. wanted to be a test location, we might get them sooner at much less cost. So certainly uh, be interested in pursuing some. We did way. take this pursuant to your agency recommendation. We took it to our CRA advisory board uh, last week, and they have asked us to start looking into that as well to see how that would look. The, the issue with a circulator has always been the demand side model. We've had a trolley before in the past. We've tried multiple public-private partnerships. None of them last because there's just no demand for it. Uh, and so maybe tastes are changing. We're, we're going to see people using them. Um, but the CRA advisory board was concerned about if you're going to make this investment, can we take a look at what those demand metrics might look like? I'm very glad that they're looking at it, because quite frankly, when you start talking about making the library parking remote, that might be, you know, the library parking in the middle of the park down Harper Avenue. You're going to need to get those people back and forth to the library because of the demographics you're dealing with. So maybe that's the place we should try to get the, uh, the uh, autonomous vehicle. I mean, perhaps just as you're thinking of these things. I did go sit in an autonomous vehicle that was using LiDAR. It is pretty stinking cool. Polytech, did you go? Uh, no, the guy's over by UCF. Um, starts with an I, and I can't remember the yeah. name. Well, that, you know, that, I, in fact, I have a question about that. Well, do you if, have any more questions on the budget? We need to oh, no, yeah, the budget sorry. here. Well, we're actually going to have to put money into infrastructure around our streets if we hope to support autonomous vehicles yeah those are fairly new like no one is doing one called with beep right now is what they're actually running so we'll be curious to see how that one pans out um, and you got to be careful about routes and how those would look and safety and perception and all that so i think it's probably still a little out on the autonomous vehicle to make sure we got precedent in place first there and how it's working properly um, but uh, if we could I, I would suggest the cra advisory board can look into this effort can talk with tab and can start looking at the demand side model for a circulator so if there is no appetite to put dollars in the budget right now does that prohibit us moving forward to try to to do this no not at all it's we just, can, I think there's, there's, it's just investigating it and looking more into that seeing what grant opportunities are available and then i think also watching the county led you know one cent sales tax that would provide you so we're talking about not this year is what you're saying i wouldn't be allocating hard dollars to it now no all right and um i suppose my fellow commissioners will have to vote on that at some point right okay thank you Mr. Seidel, we've moved on to your items. Yep, thank you. Uh, Lakemont Ave study, you'd asked about a Lakemont Avenue roadway diet study, including conceptual plans and public meetings from the hospital to Pine Avenue. 
Um, we have said that this poor transportation planner who's going to be doing all our work uh, may be able to start to address this uh, in October 1st. Um, and then also uh, public works and planning are getting together to determine what might be required for some sort of study like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, 1792 corridor modeling, I think we spoke about that earlier. Um, yep, thank you. Awesome. All right, reduce the millage rate. Uh, Commissioner, this was uh, your comment based on the uh, staff estimate last year that if this new homestead exemption had passed, it would cost us $750,000. You had asked what would our millage rate look like now if we needed to remove $750,000 in total uh, uh, property taxes, our millage rate would go down to 3.9660. And that would also um, result in about an 87K reduction in CRA, re CRA revenues because, of course, it's calculated off the millage rate as well. So where would we put our plus minus? If we included this, well, uh, if you wanted to take out, so right now we're uh, we're at about even, we're net six, but you have about two hundred. You still have the nine hundred and thirty-one thousand dollars in the original contingency. Taking out seven hundred and fifty would take you below. You'd have to take out the commuter rail piece. You'd have to take out the two hundred and ninety-six, um, and then you'd have to take about a hundred thousand dollars or so out of the um, uh, remaining. Um, budget policy contingency that you guys have in place. However, as a commission, you are able to override that policy in any given year that you want. Okay. So, you guys, I wanted to have this in here because it was something that I had brought up a couple years ago when we first knew this law was uh, um, going to be voted on. And I would like to sit here and say how fortunate we all are that, um, you know, we're talking about what we can add, not what we have to subtract, right? So we've got this contingency fund, but had we, you know, what I had asked staff to do was if we were getting hit with that other homestead exemption that we didn't have to raise our revenues to cover it. So if we would have gotten hit with it this year, we wouldn't have 900,000, we would have 200,000. So I'm just trying to frame this discussion that we're talking about is, you know, um, you know, our staff did what we asked. We asked them to make sure that we wouldn't have to raise taxes if that passed and that, you know, is it prudent for us to try and cut some of our taxes because we do have the increase of the uh, library millage that's on there. And so I, I'm not giving you an exact number now, but I just want us all to be thinking about it. And I know it's going to affect some of the budgets, but as we kind of think of these things that we get to ask for, realizing that, you know, you're talking to someone that's been asking to do things for years, um, that how fortunate we are to be in this position right now. So. Um, that's all I'll say about it right now. I, I agree. It's a first world problem. Um, I wanted to ask about the, the SunRail um, funds there. I've seen numbers um, for our responsibility quite a bit higher than that. And are we accumulating money for the first year that we're responsible? Oh, Randy, sorry. Yeah, that's right. No, no, we're not accumulating. Our, our, our obligation is capped at three hundred seventy-five, three fifty, three hundred fifty thousand dollars uh, and then there's an equal amount, I believe, for the liability side. If it's incurred, right. Yeah. But as a, I think it has the same, the same cap, if I'm not mistaken. But what we've, done, what we've done in the budget each year is we haven't been setting aside money for SunRail. That's a common misconception. We've been creating a larger and larger carve-out for SunRail for the year when we have to start paying the amount. So... So yes, behavioral, right? And, and, and when is that? And so it's rolling. It's rolling into the into content, into fund balance each right. year when we don't spend it because we're not actually spending it yet. But once once we get to the year, which I think is 2022, 21 right. or 22, yeah. 2021 or 22, when we have to actually have to start paying the 350,000, we will have already carved out that much out of our spending habit so that we can fund it without without a problem now this is also something that if the penny transportation the sales tax yes. passes we believe that would cover this as the dedicated funding source but but that's not that would not happen until november 2021 so you know it's a it's a big still a long shot at this point well but it's really important that the dedicated funding source for sunrail has always been talked about it has never gone through and been pushed we're getting close and i can guarantee you when we have to start spending three hundred fifty thousand dollars it's going to get even closer so i do think the one cent a saleable thing about the one cent is that it would go for the sunrail so i i think that this is a great lesson for us to keep 
you know, keep doing, that we should be doing just what we're doing, but we haven't spent a dime on it yet, okay? So we have to be sure we know that's not money we've spent. Just, just while we're on that topic, the other thing that I'd like us to be cautious about is um, the $350,000 that we're addressing for liability. I think that's, um, I, I remember something happened about that, and I honestly cannot remember the details. Yeah, we'll look, we'll look at that and get yeah, back to that. Yeah, let's get yeah, back I, to I, real. I recall the same thing. Yeah, I think we both, I think we need to understand that a little bit better because that, that's a big piece of the pie, the liability. And I'm hoping that went away, and for some reason I thought it did, but I'm not sure. Okay, hey, Peter, next item, please. Sure. Uh, last item, sir, is your lake health analysis. Uh, review of lake health analysis with recommendations for improvements for all lakes in Winter Park. Review of information currently collected and what measures or actions may be needed, uh, we may need to be improving upon. Um, in Public Works, we spoke with them and they said they'll review and return with recommendations regarding that because they already collect a fair amount of data regarding lake, how, lake health and I believe want to probably provide that to you and, and see what you think at that point and then go from there. And this is kind of similar to the tree ordinance. It's like, what have we been doing? What can we be sure. doing better? And um, Or is everything we're doing good? So that's what I was looking to do. Do you mind if we throw air quality into that mix? I was a little surprised to see Orlando at the top of the list there. I do mind. You do? Okay. Can yeah, we, can I, don't we wanna, have a, I don't want to dilute the, I understand the that. objective. Um, but I would like to look at on a separate, in a separate workshop is fine, the air quality piece. Okay. Do you, have, you want to bring that back up questions. later when two we have our commission questions. talks? Okay. I have two, two budget questions. Absolutely. Okay, first, what is the percentage of staff that gets merit pay right now? Well, I mean, all, all of staff is eligible for merit pay. Typically, everyone will, will get some sort of increase, and it depends upon the performance. I, I need to provide you that data. I know you asked me that the other day, and I... I I did not get that information yet. I'll get that for you. Okay, I just would like to see that to make sure our staff's taken care of. I know that you have in here, that is in here because you're trying to make sure that we stay at the, at the right place for that. So I just want to make sure. Also about the health clinic that we funded, was that been in existence two years now? Uh, I'm two, three? Yeah, just third finished year. our third okay. year. We, I just kind of wanted to know, are we going to keep that going the way it's going? Is that the way we need to keep going? We're going to keep it going. It's worked very well. We're going to change the model slightly effective October 1, it looks like. We're, we're in the process of looking at that. We, we see some areas for improvement. But the budget that you have in here for that, that's adequate? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so Peter, if you want to run through what items we currently have some agreement on, if you will, that uh, just kind of run through, you had a number you said we were like even at the moment? Well, so that's, that's my presumptuous assumption that you would take the, uh, the staff uh, suggested changes regarding state revenue estimates, the uh, new SRO reimbursement figures, the cybersecurity position, and the uh, water and wastewater interlocal, which of course is not affecting the general fund. Um, so let's see, my up six would include adopting our revenue adjustments that take us some to the upside, picking up the cybersecurity position, picking up the weeds, and picking up the library, and we're up a net 6K, so that puts you up at 937K in total contingency. And that was doing the Palashik out of the, so the, out of the organizational support Correct, line sir. item and the housing authority out of the, out of the affordable, affordable housing, housing trust fee. fund. Mm -hmm. Really, j just put the weeds back into the, into parks and rec. We are in the weeds. You're in the yes. weeds, and then but but it does include the IT for for library. For, yeah, it included yes. the IT for the library. Yes, okay. So the way I would sum that up is you've approved page one, and let's see, and the first two items on page two, which were the weeds and the library ERP system. So after that, we were sort of in discussions of further studies and finding more information or some, using some existing pots to pursue some of those things.
Yeah, I get, I'm looking at the um, commission here. That's what I was trying to get, Peter. If you just kind of wanted to summarize the ones we're all in agreement, do we try and do one motion for that? And I'd, I'd move that we uh, accept what Peter's just mentioned and uh, vote on it. Do I have a second? Do you want me to restate them? Oh, sorry. All right. Um, I will go ahead and uh, second that, and then I'll ask, just like on the agenda, is there any items you'd like to pull on here for discussion, um, like your electric vehicles? We can have a separate discussion on that? Yeah. Okay. That's fine. So you want to move that to include it? Yes, I would like to include some, and I do not have a specific dollar value, some dollar value that you can deal with to start implementing a commitment to electric vehicles. Okay. Well, what do you have in there for those 14 new vehicles? I mean, that, I mean, maybe you already have it in there, you just reallocate it, in, or maybe you add 20 or you know, something. Just put one car. So yeah. do you want to make a motion that two of the vehicles purchased be electric vehicles? do that. Yes, I will move that two of the vehicles purchased be electric vehicles. Second. That can be a part of the whole motion as far as I just don't want to get into telling them what to buy. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll call it an amended motion. Two at all is one. So, uh, Peter, if you could indulge me, um, and we've got three pages here, so if you just start with the first item and say whether or not it's included, and we can put a check next to it so we have a good idea of everything that we're including. Yes, sir. Okay, so on the first page, state revenue estimates changes, check. Police school resource officers, check. Cybersecurity IT position, water and wastewater interlocal. Palashik Museum. These Housing. are all checks, right? These are all checks. Housing Authority. Check. Mead Garden. Everything on the first page, yes. Mead Garden Weeds. Check. Library ERP. Check. We had mentioned MLK Park Plan that we're reviewing that, so I'm assuming you all are content with that review and we'll bring that back to you. Yes. We'll say pseudo check. Uh, drainage Plan for the City. We'd mentioned CRA's funding. We're going to bring back uh, those for you through the CRA and then we can look at that in the future. Um, Parks and Rec bike path, that's going to be part of the overall transportation master plan and why our new transportation planner will never speak to us. Uh, Palashik <laughs> Museum, we got. Stormwater master plan that we sort of talked about. Uh, corridor traffic model, I don't have clarity from you all on whether you want to move forward on this now, but our staff statement is you have funding in the CRA to pursue this if you want to do it. Uh, yeah, I would, I would say okay. we use the CRA I'm funding. I'm seeing a yes. All right. Yeah. Yeah. But I, what I was trying to do, Sarah, is anything that's going to be dollars in this budget amount right now. Okay, I got it. So we're not, yeah, so this one is to be determined, and there's no, okay, got it, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So then we're now on the last page. Yes, because I think Commissioner Cooper, we said we would talk about funding the things outside of the CRA for PD&E when we get closer to that, whatever that start point might be. Um, we said we could review transportation impact fee as part of uh, the mobility fee study. Um, we had the established commercial parks usage impact fee. I believe we're going to look into some methodology options and what other places are. are when we have something doing. to fund, y yes. we'll look at that alternative. Okay. Uh, new vehicle purchases. I believe I just heard we're going to do at least two of our new vehicles purchased will be electric. Yes. So that'll be included as part of two that. electric vehicles. Okay. Um, I like at least two. At least two. We we will we will take a look at what we can what we can do. If it's more, it'll be more. Uh, I have a little less clarity on where you want us to go with the circulator shuttle in the short term. We'd like to study it and come back to you guys to the CR advisory board. Yay! Right. We do to be successful. Okay. Peter, I, um, possibly we could maybe. Um, put together a list of specifications for it. How many seats? Does it have air conditioning? Is it wide open like uh, Sanford's? Yeah, let's bus, let's, let's let like him that. investigate that. Okay, thanks. I mean, that's, we haven't even said that's what yeah. we want yet, guys. Okay, I, that's just, this is a budget, but 
I just I don't want to see us. There was a time we got rid of a shuttle up here, guys. Right. So we, we be, so better we be careful be before successful. we so add something in that doesn't get used. Right. We, we want it to be successful, but we also want to be timely in order to participate in the Volkswagen dollars if they're out there. I like how you think. Okay. okay. Uh, Legmont Ave study, I think we're going to come back to you with that. That'll be sort of a go-forward study. Uh, we talked about the 1792 corridor modeling. Uh, reduce millage rate. I'm assuming that's going to be a separate conversation. And then lake health analysis, we sort of come back to you with information. Okay, excellent. So, uh, oh, I got one suggestion. We did say on here cyber security IT position. I would rather not say position, just cyber security IT, because uh, whether it's a person or it's I stuff, concur. okay? Yeah. And at, at the risk of lengthening this, you asked that we discuss hot water sh at the Kittyway pool, hot water in the showers. Yeah. Is that is that in the plan? Do we have in our do we have a plan to to let to to put hot water in? Don't the bathrooms. We, the bathrooms at Katy Way? Not, not at this point. Heating in place, seeing how that goes, and then that would be the down the line. We we do have a cost from before Troy. I don't know if you remember what that was, but it was. It was a crazy amount of money because, I mean. Can we look at solar? Yeah, the issue is replumbing, you guys. It's all cold water. There's no hot water lines. Yeah, uh, there's no hot water so, lines. So they, they'd have to it, add the hot water lines or maybe at, at least maybe make like one or two showers hot. You know what I mean? Give them something. Yeah, I do know what you mean. <laughs> I don't want to get in a cold shower. So I just want us to not lose that. Eventually, it would be really nice if we put that in our capital. But I don't want to be, uh, you know, I, I don't think we can do it today. Yeah, I think if we can get some investigation and, and uh, some options there. Okay. Anything else? Nope. All right. So, Randy, do I need to take public comments now on this? Yes, yes sir. Or, uh, okay, before we vote on it. So everyone's heard the discussion. If you understand or have a question on the items that we're voting on, you'd like to make a public comment. Uh, anyone want to come up now? All right. Uh, I got a quick staff question. I'm so sorry. Yep, How okay. much of this is reducing the $296,000 worth of contingency? So far we have not. We've, we're pretty much pretty much the same. I think we're net six thousand up, so we're actually at nine thirty-seven if I'm doing my, my math right. Okay. And that includes the four vehicles. Good point. We'd have to come back to you on that, but my guess is five to five to eight k per vehicle. Good. Okay. So it's not horrible. It's worth doing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Randy. We should read the roll for this one. Yes, sir. Please. Okay. Commissioner Sprinkle? Yes. Commissioner Cooper? Yes. Commissioner Weaver? Yes. Vice Mayor Seidel? Yes. All right, so that concludes our budget discussion. Thank you. Um, we'll take public comments right now, and then we'll, uh, do you guys want to take a short break, or do you want to continue to move forward after public comments? I'd like a break. Okay, so, uh, okay, we'll take public comments, and then we'll have a, um, then I'll announce the break. To be clear, it's public comments on anything not on the agenda tonight. Ah, thank you, Andy. Anything not on the agenda you guys want to talk about? All right, uh, seeing none, why don't we go ahead and take, uh, oh, wait a minute, we've got one. Sorry. Hello, how's everyone? Maria Bryant, 450 South Virginia Avenue. I am here tonight on a completely different subject about Global Peace Day. And Commissioner uh, Carolyn is going to mention something later, I do believe. But uh, the gentleman that is the peace manager at Valencia College had to step out. But I would love to give you guys literature. Um, the city of Orlando is heavily involved with Valencia College um, Peace and Justice Initiative and Program. And we're having something in the park September 21st, which is on a Saturday. Uh, from 9 a.m. to 12. And we would love to have you guys a part of it. Chief Dill has definitely said he's going to do his best to try to be a part of it or send representation. And this is what I would like to leave for you. It's Williams, Card, and Rachel Allen, the director and the manager. So if you would be so kind, each, well, I only have five principals, so I don't have enough. Maria, if we can't do the entire 
four hours? Is no, we don't want you to do that. Then what time are you talking about? Like, you guys preferably will be there at least 9 a.m. from 9 to 9.15 okay. if you consent to it. Okay. And I have the principles. I unfortunately only have five. That's enough? That's enough? Okay. I, and I have all of that. You do? Yeah. They're, they're housed at our Winter Park Valencia campus, guys. This mm -hmm. is a really big part of Winter Park, and we have participated in the past. We need to keep participating. Thank you. What's the date? September 21st, and Todd, I was going to message you, you so, but I don't have to now. So I, I think. And Maria, it would be it would be helpful if we understood exactly what it is you needed us to do. That would be helpful. What we are asking for the city to be a part uh, with the commissioners and the mayor, if you could read a principle, be just one, and you choose the one that basically speaks to your heart. And um, that, I think Anna Eskamani, she will be there amongst other leaders. And we just really want you to be a part I'm so sorry to do this. Uh, no, it's she, okay. I'm just trying to make sure we don't all pick the same one. Okay. And, you know, make sure that we're okay. organized. And so if I send you guys an email and, and, and ask you about your principles, would you respond to me? Yes. Okay. I'll do that. I'll follow up. That was one thing. Second thing, I have submitted emails to you. Please come and support the new initiative. There's been so much talk about the public library, what's happening, what's not happening, who's happy, who's not. So we decided to do a series of music to bring everybody together, hopefully. And the kickoff is September 13th. So hopefully you guys will come out and support it and make this place exactly what we want it to be. Work, live, and play. That is all for me. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Ms. Brent. Any other additional public comments? On anything that's not on the agenda? Yeah. Uh, give us your name and address real quick. Yes. Tor Tompkins, 345 Legacy Park Drive, Castleberry, Florida. Thank you. So I am the owner of an eco-friendly car wash company called Green Phantom LLC. Um, actually, we have three locations in Orlando right now. There's one in Waterford Lakes. There's one in um, Dr. Phillips, Marketplace of Dr. Phillips. And there's also one down in the uh, Target Shopping Center, um, City of Orlando. So to get this thing rolling, basically, we're 10 years old. Um, I had to go through um, BZA in Orange County <clears throat> and Board of uh, County Commission, City Commissions. Um, also, um, I had to get a conditional use permit uh, as well in the City of Orlando. And basically what we do is we operate in shopping centers, um, usually C1 zones. Um, so as demand grows, um, we would like to expand into Winter Park. Um, the problem is that you guys have really strict um, zoning rules for C1. Which is not a, that's not really a problem. It's just the fact that we don't really fit into a, a category per se. So where you think car wash, we're not a car wash. We don't have a facility. Um, we're eco friendly. Everything's done by hand. Um, and basically, our, like our customers are shopping in the shopping center, or they go to the movies. Um, they eat, whatever they want to do. And while that happens, um, my employees basically take they detail your car right there in a the lot. Um, <clears throat> you guys have really tight parking restrictions. I understand it's, it's super crowded in Winter Park, every shopping center there is to go to. Um, but basically, before I moved forward to like, do a deal with a shopping center, um, <clears throat> I've learned to, to go the route of asking um, my city first and, you know, to see if it's something we could do. Um, and I spoke to uh, Mr. Bronze Planning <laughs> and uh, uh, also the mayor uh, about this whole concept and basically I was guided towards this direction to explain to you guys what it is I'm doing what it is I would like to do in the city and to see how you guys felt about it essentially I'm not sure exactly how all this works you know in this age but um, I definitely wanted to present the idea but we are eco-friendly we're green we're sustainable um, there's no water runoff um, there's no water reclamation we can do a car with one cup of water um, we book appointments online, we, we take walk-ins, um, <clears throat> that's like about the gist of it. Okay, if, um, I'll just go ahead and add a suggestion, was to find out from staff what, you know, the ordinances are that you're not exactly meeting, and then, uh, I, and then I would suggest provide that to the commissioners if you want to talk to us each, and kind of, you know, I, I don't know another way to figure it out, Randy, that's kind of... Right. 
I'll be happy to meet with Bronson in the morning and, and uh, see, figure that out also, and then we can get back with this gentleman. Yeah, and, you know, if you got, like, the sustainability board on board with you, that would probably help a lot as well. Right. And as far as following up with you, when I find that out from Bronx, um Yeah, so if you kind of go through Randy, okay. uh, that, that would probably be best. And then and we have the sunshine laws we have to deal with, so Randy can kind of coordinate with the rest of us. Yes, sir. But I don't know that, you know, I don't know what the next step is, and that's what I hope Randy would figure out. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any more public comments this time? Okay, we we'll want to take a break. You want to do 10 minutes, or how about 12 minutes till 6:10? It's 5:58. We'll start back up at 10 after 6. So, thank you, everybody.
Okay, it's uh, six eleven. I'm a minute late getting us restarted. If um, if we could please uh, come back in the chambers. Um, we did lose a uh, great resident in the city of Winter Park, and just before we got into our public hearings, I'm going to let Sarah say a few words. Well, I just wanted to say that uh, anybody who knew Richard Swan knows that he's going to leave a real a real hole in our community. Robin, of course, works at our chamber and works with Betsy. So uh, Robin is married to Christian, who's one of Richard's kids. He had four kids. They lived across the street from me on Highland Road when I lived in my first house. Uh, in Winter Park, and so I've always admired them a great deal, and certainly admired Richard and what he's done. So it's he's a big loss to our community, and you probably read about him. He was they did a very nice uh, article about him in the paper. So he has a upcoming service on Wednesday. Thank you, Sarah. If we could just take a, a moment of silence for Richard, then we'll get going. Thank you. Right. Thank you, everybody. Um, so we'll get into our public hearings now. Item uh, 12A. Yeah, this first public hearing is a request to terminate an existing development agreement that we have on the property that's in the city at 1345 Clay Street. And if you've driven down Clay Street, you may not have noticed this little white farmhouse-looking building that was built in 1924 or 1925. And the story behind this is that in 2005, the property was for sale, and some folks that had a mental health counseling business wanted to buy it. It was zoned residential. They talked to Orange County about getting it rezoned, and the county said they would not. Uh, they came to talk to us since Winter Park's on the other side of Clay Street, and we said, well, we'll rezone it if you guarantee that you'll preserve this historic home. So the deal was reached, and this home is on our Register of Historic Places for the city, which means it has to be preserved, and they were allowed via our rezoning to utilize the interior for that mental health counseling business. And so this is called adaptive reuse, where you preserve historic structures by providing it with another useful lifetime of service. And so it's been that way ever since. When we were doing that in 2005, there were some neighbors who live nearby, and when they hear medical and doctor, they were concerned about traffic and parking because, you know, most doctors have a lot of traffic and parking for their clientele. But inside this house, it's, it's a house. I mean, you go in and there's, there's, you can see where the kitchen was and where the dining room was and the living room and the bedrooms upstairs. I mean, the interior floor plan is not examining rooms and set up for waiting rooms and that kind of thing. It's still the interior floor plan of a house. But in order to placate or to mollify the residents at the time, we agreed to the development agreement that if they were ever gonna come back and put somebody into this house office, uh, that, and we thought it was gonna have markedly more traffic or parking needs, uh, that it would need approval from the city. Of course, there's no way to gauge to say what's more, more than what. And it's really not set up that it can ever functionally have more traffic than it has, because again, inside, it is a house. Uh, the property uh, was for sale. During the closing activities, this became a big problem with the financing of the loan and with the title insurance, because now, Anytime a tenant changes or anytime there's a sale, the city can veto it if we think that there is going to be more parking or uh, more traffic going to the building. So in order to avoid that scenario in the future, because it is what it is, uh, they, were, they have asked the city if we could terminate the agreement and rely upon just the regular provisions that we have in our office zoning, because it's only so big it only has so many parking places. 
It's only so much land, and you can't tear it down and build anything new. This building is staying as is. They also feel that conditions have changed from before because now we have a very large apartment complex that's being built next door in the former Calvary Church parking lot. And so no one should realistically be concerned about a couple more cars coming from this property given the traffic impact that's going to come from the apartments that is going to be able to come down the same street and go out to Clay as well. So uh, that's why the request is here. We do have uh, uh, one of the requesters here if there are questions, but from the staff's perspective, we felt that the office zoning provided enough protections that we already have. Questions? Does the um, lot right now as it is have enough parking to satisfy the code for 01 with what's in there? It does. Okay, that's good. It's encouraging. Yeah. Um, and there's I, limited ability to add parking. So and, and what does the new owner want to do with the property? I believe we have him right here. I'm Dr. Jerry Horton, and I'm the medical director of MDH Management. I plan to put my medical office there, a small medical spa, continuing to preserve the house and the style of it. It's actually nice that for a small practice office, we'll probably have less people coming through there than what it has been with the psychology group. Okay. Thank you. It's very kind of you to address my question. I do have another question. Um, can I ask the applicant? Or yeah, I, just, I had a quick question for Jeff. Okay, yeah. I'll just I didn't finish with, with Jeff real quick. So, Jeff, just so I properly understand our current historic preservation ordinance and the way this is, that if there was something dramatically wrong with the house, they would be able to rebuild it as it is or in the architectural style or this, they really have to continue to just fix it up. I'm just, I'm just asking if there's any possibility of someone coming through and. So this is a road that we haven't gone down. If someone can demonstrate to the Historic Preservation Board that a home is not repairable under any circumstances, then they can tear it down. Of course, they still may have to build a structure of a of an architectural style from the period, craftsmen, etc. So for example, if they had a fire that took down two thirds of this building, like we had with the one on North Park Avenue, that creates that kind of scenario. But no one can come to the board and go, oh, I just have a lot of wood rot and I have this issue and I, that. Okay, I'm just, uh, yeah, what I was really trying to protect more was that you couldn't build something that didn't match the historic character. Oh, and so on that any site, additions correct? have to go to HPB exactly for that purpose. But even if they rebuilt, rebuilt from the fire, they would have to build to the time period. Correct. No matter if it's office or okay. Correct. That's I just want to get that clarification. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeff. Haven't we had a time when we actually removed a designation from a property? No, we had no? a time when what we happened with the when that was debated, but we okay. never did remove it. Good. Okay, so I was hoping we didn't make that mistake. Nope, okay, all right. So, so, so my concern. concern if you'd like to come up like to, to the, to the uh, podium, right? Thanks. Thank you for your candidness and talking to me about this. Um, when the original agreement was put in place, obviously there were considerations on both sides of the fence. And the property owner, I don't know, it was another property owner, at that point in time got an upzoning on the property and he moved into Winter Park and the city got to preserve the house. And, and it wasn't a problem in normal zoning because in normal zoning, um, once an office, always an office. But my concern is if I, can you put uh, the map that I gave you up on, I just, I just want, I'll show you this too so you know why I'm concerned. And, and I'd like my fellow commissioners to see this. If you look at the property in blue, behind that property, there are two other pieces of property and they're both zoned R2, low density residential. If you come south on the road all along Clay, all of those properties are also zoned R2, low density residential. And across the road, it's all R1 single family. So. Orlando came along and they allowed this PD, which ended up putting 310 units 
right at your back door and the back door of two other um, residential, low density residential. Um, to me, if we're gonna go back on an agreement, we need to revert things back to the way they used to be. And um, I understand we're probably too late in the process for us to do that, which would be, yes, yes, we're gonna do away with this agreement for you, but oh, by the way, you go back to the original zoning, which was R2 residential. And I'm not asking you to do that, but what I am asking you is if you would be willing to agree to limit any future residential use of your property to R2 low density residential standards. That's, that's my concern. What I would not want to see is something to happen to this property so that it becomes used as um, office residential. Because in the city of Winter Park, unlike many other cities, our office residential, our office actually allows residential use at about 17 units per acre, where all your neighbors would have residential use at an R2 low density level, which is about half that, I think, maybe. Is that right, Bronx, about half that? I think, I think R2, which is what all your neighbors that are in aligned with you have, only allows yeah, so on this particular property, the R2 zoning would allow about 2.1 units per acre, where 17 units per acre would allow five, but that is only if... Right, if everything else fell into... And, and my if thought was the two adjacent... Was removed and, right. and that sort of thing. And, and really, doing a little basic math here, the, the parking requirements for that number of units would really make... Make Even if you difficult. had the two lots behind it? If you added the two lots behind it? Mm -hmm. um, well, those aren't in city limits. Okay. So, so, so my question to you, I don't, I don't want to get you all tied up in all this, but my question to you is, are you willing to agree to utilize your property either as office or not to exceed the low density residential zoning that's consistent with all your neighbors? That's that's the question. I, I'm still not sure how that historic designation, I, mean, I have no t intent to modify the exterior building at all. Wonderful, that's wonderful. Okay, so so you will be continuing to use it as office? Yes. That's your agreement. And okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Does anybody else have a question for you? Any other questions? I'll, I'll question move it. the attorney. Yeah. I'll move it. Thank you. Kurt, my question to you is? But we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay. My, my question to you is, um, is that is, we have an agreement right now that could very easily, because I, I do agree with you, it should not be nearly as restrictive as it is. That, that's way over the top. But commissioner, and I can, they can't use it as residential at all. That's what it's I want to hear. office zoning on the first floor only. Okay, good. They have a second Perfect. floor. It has two bedrooms. It can't be okay. that kind of units. All right. So they can't at all. All right. That's, okay, that works for me. I just wanted to make sure it could not be torn down and it could not be utilized as high density residential. I don't want to do the same thing to our neighbors that Orlando did. Thank well, you. that was my, it has to go to the Historic Preservation Board, right? That's what I wanted to make sure that that had some... Did this go to the Preservation Board? Yes. It did? The in there's no, initially... There's nothing here with minutes or telling No, us. When, it, when it got the original designation, it went to the Historic but Preservation this, Board. But this, the request to do away with this agreement... Did this agreement okay. was with the Commission, not with the Historic Additions Preservation Board. Additions or changes to the exterior of the board. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll take public comment now. Good evening, I'm Betsy Gardner Eckbert, President and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce, and I am a resident at 541 Fairfax Avenue in Winter Park, I'm speaking in two capacities. Number one, Dr. Horton is a member of the Chamber of Commerce and a member in good standing. More importantly, he's my 20-year friend and my personal physician. He runs a boutique medical practice. He has not asked me to speak tonight, but I can speak to the quality of the care that he delivers and that he does not run a huge, high-volume, grind-em-in-and-out practice. Um, he has a very 
very boutique practice that's very consistent with Winter Park, and I can assure you that that would be uh, a, a permitted use that would be consistent with Winter Park's quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, any more discussion? Okay, if we go ahead and call the roll, please. Commissioner Sprinkle? Yes. Commissioner Cooper? Yes. Commissioner Weaver? Yes. Vice Mayor Saito? Yes. yes. Thank you, and good luck. Okay, the next item on our public hearing agenda is a subdivision or lot split of the property at 2700 Wright Avenue. And you can see on the big overhead, there's a location on the corner of Wright and Winter Park Road. And here's a little bigger view with the property, as you can see what we use for the 500 foot radius. The property has 156 feet going down Winter Park Road and 134 feet as you go down Wright Avenue. The zoning is R1A, so you need 75 feet, 85 in the corner lot. The simplest thing that could have been done was to come in here and ask to split the property east-west. You would have had a 75-foot lot, you would have had an 81 foot lot. It would have been a little four foot variance. That would have been de minimis. We would have no problem with it whatsoever. But there are three gorgeous, huge OMG live oak trees. <laughs> <laughs> OMG in the backyard of the property on the southern portion that are 40 inches. 45 inches and 50 inches in diameter that I'm told the, pre, the current owner planted when he built the house in 1967. There you see the three trees in the backyard. So what the prospective buyer is asking to do is to divide the lot into two lots fronting on Wright Avenue. Makes the frontages smaller, but in terms of lot area, they're comparable to the other lot areas in the surrounding neighborhood. And what we get as the general public in return for those variances is we get a permanent easement over those three live oak trees that they will not be able to cut them down, that they will be restricted on the amount of limb pruning and limb removal that they can do so that these Three live oaks will stay in place. And really, they're an amenity for the new homeowners as, as much as the previous one. And so there definitely is a quid pro quo that we are gaining from letting them divide it this way versus they would be wider lots if they're on Winter Park Road. And so we did have our public hearing at Planning and Zoning. No neighbors showed up in opposition and planning and zoning recommended approval that the applicant enter into a tree preservation agreement with the city to preserve the three live oaks in the rear of these split lots. We are still in the process of looking at some word changes to that agreement with the city attorney's office. The first draft that we put in your books talked about it in the context of issuing permits from all your discussions today, we probably need to change some of those words to make sure it's a commitment from the owners as well as the tree permit in case the day comes we're never issuing permits. And so we can make those changes. And then the other condition has to do with the varied architecture, and that is what they are planning to do in terms of both the look of them and also the floor plan, the site plan arrangement. One has a front entry garage as you see, and one has, has a different uh, arrangement, so they will look different on the street. So with that explanation, you do have a recommendation for approval from P&Z. Discussion? Questions? Questions for staff. How far is it from um, the actual tree to the house, and has Drew assessed the... Um, it is roughly the reality of, I don't want to see another tree die it because... Is roughly it, I believe those are pools, so the distance to the pools is what we're really worried about, right? Yeah. Dig so it's roughly about 20 feet 
between the tree and the pool excavation, and that more or less is what Drew's guidance to me has been in the past, is so keep did 20 feet from the tree for the tree and keep at least 40 feet of the limbs. Perfect. So Drew took a look at these? Oh, wonderful. I just don't want to repeat what we did on Orange Avenue. I still feel so bad about that. Um, I can support this simply because to me, I don't want to see the, the curb cuts out on Winter Park Road, you know, for me. And, and the fact that we also can save three heritage trees, and you really believe we can save these? Absolutely. Wonderful. I'd love to hear that. Thank you. Jeff, is there a precedent for um, this kind of arrangement? Have we done this before? Uh, yes, we have. In okay. fact, right around the corner on East End, uh, there was a lot split approved for two 50-foot lots, and we, ha we came away with a tree preservation easement for two live oaks that were on the lot that was already built on. Okay, thank you. And, and Kurt, um, do, do you see any conflict with this and previous agreements like this with the new um, state statute? I think we'll probably want to tweak some of this based on the discussion we had earlier with respect to that. I think Jeff, Jeff is encouraging that as well, so not tie it completely just to the permitting, but make it a, just a flat uh, requirement. So if it's done by agreement, there should be no issue. Thank you. And, and one other thing, sorry. Um, how, how many other lots um, within the 500-foot radius are um, width-wise smaller than what's proposed here? Uh, roughly about a third of them are this size or smaller, and the other two-thirds are larger. So is it true that some of them are as narrow as 50 feet? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. Thank you. Sarah. Okay, so I, I will move this and, and I will support it, but, but I have an issue with how we do this, and I think it's something that we need to think about, okay? So we're up here tonight approving a lo two lots are going to be smaller than what we allow people to build on. That's what, that's what we're doing, and one of them is on a corner lot, which, you know, there's many of these requests. And we as a commission either have to say to ourselves and to our, our constituents, we look at each and every one of these individually and make the best decision we can as a result of the heritage trees and of the neighborhood and whatever it is, all of the above. And I don't have any trouble looking in the mirror when I do that. I have no trouble whatsoever. And, and I think that's what we're elected to do. And I know that's what you've done here because that's why you're bringing it back to us like that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, okay, we can also get ourselves in trouble if we say we don't, we don't do this because we do do it. We're doing it right now. So I think it behooves us as a commission to say out loud what we're doing today is in the best interest of Obviously, somebody wants it. Obviously, nobody is supposing it in the community. So all of those are the positives. And, and at the same time, I hear from the people who say, well, you did it for them. Why won't you do it for me? We have to come back with some way to explain that better than what we've done in the past. That's all I'm, I'm saying, because when I first <coughs> read this, I thought, wait, we just had one of these we didn't approve, OK? Now, how am I going to go look at those people in the face and say, but this one's different? We just have to be really aware of that. That's all. But I'm moving this one. I'm, I'm going to trust that, that you all have done the best job you can with this, and I do trust that. Honestly, I'm one of the people that generally would say no. I mean, just say no. Yeah, we, you guys, we have, a, we, we have a motion on the floor. The cuts on do we have a second right? on the motion? I'll second. Thank you. But I do have a legal question before we move forward. I yes. do not understand what it means for us to have an easement. Does that mean that we are responsible to come in and prune it every six months? What does it mean that we have an easement? You, we can craft it however we want it. Okay. So we With respect. respect. Right. Well, an easement gives you certain property rights. So we have an interest, actually an interest in, in the property as an easement. So the easement, 
as a protected. I'm happy about it. I just need to understand what sure. it means. Sure. So, so if we want the right to go in and prune and trim and fertilize and and the like, we certainly can provide for that. However, I don't think that's the intent. So, but and he's a tree preservation easement would give us the right to preserve the tree. Uh, we can enhance the language. I mean, it's well, there's not a form agreement in the in the code that provides for that. So it's a yeah. I mean, to, to follow his, his his point, there's like I do agreements on stormwater ponds. The DOT agrees to use the pond, but they always reserve the right to go and maintain the pond if it's not being maintained by the agency. So if these trees are not being maintained by the owner, the city has the right to go in and do something to take care of the trees. And so we don't expect the owners not to take care of the trees. We expect them to. But it also, like, if you get an owner that, you know, he doesn't like trees and he wants to poison them and kill them, you know, it's okay. We, we can't go in and try and save them. No, and, and my issue was I just needed to understand whether the owner of the home was still responsible to take care of the tree, and we only went in as an exception if it wasn't being taken care of or if we were proposing something different. And it sounds like if we're going to do it consistent with the water district, we only do it as an exception if they're not taking care of it. We can add the language that makes that perfectly clear and giving us the right in the event but not the obligation in no way, shape, yeah, or form. Could, could I ask Drew if she has any um, comments on this easement? Do you see any hardship for the city um, taking this easement? No, sir, I do not. Um, you know, the most important thing is that we protected trees during the construction and staff will be you know, on site doing random visits to make sure that the root protection is in place. Yeah, it would be nice, like Drew, if you guys had a sign out front about, you know, these trees protected per easement through the city of Winter Park, because on most construction sites, what you see are people just kind of, you know, a guy's got to lay something down, there's nowhere except by the tree because no one's allowed to put anything there, so he, he sets it down by the tree. Yeah, we'll so I think kind of having something on the construction documents that people be aware of it. And we also have a signage that they can put up. And, you know, this contractor, just as a side note, has um, saved many trees throughout the, the years. Great. Thank Do you. Do we really want this, guys? Do we really want this? I mean, we want the trees saved, but do we want the easement? What if somebody falls out of one of those trees? Who's responsible? It's simply a, a preservation easement. The, um, I would give you another example. We have, a, we have a property on the north side of Central Park that has a facade easement that says, this shall be preserved, this can never change for uh, the, the Keywin offices. Uh, it's the small cottage. They have an actual easement for the facade. Gives us no responsibility to do anything. Okay. Really, it's all it's all on the owner. All right, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. I just yeah. want to make sure we're not Simply a preservation easement, not like an access maintenance, that sort of thing. That was the bit of information we needed. Thank you. I'm thrilled. Okay. Any uh, any additional questions or for staff? No. Okay. We've got a motion on the floor. We'll open up for public comments. Anyone wish to comment on item 12B on the lot split? And okay, seeing no uh, comments, I do want to just add, ask about the uh, language change. Do we need to do something for the language change now? No, the, the way Jeff presented this, it was a approval of the lot split subject to acceptable language consistent with the discussions and comments from the commission. This, uh, what Jeff put in this agreement was a a initial draft it is not the final document okay so, so the final now if you wanted to come back we can uh, but based on the direction i think you've given staff it does not need to be unless you really want to see it back there's only one uh, reading on this there's not a second reading Th that's that's correct it's not okay. an ordinance okay no i have confidence that staff has heard what we're looking to have in the agreement i don't know that i would need to see it again all right. Any no more public comments? Let's go ahead and do a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Sprinkle. Yes. Commissioner Cooper. Yes. Commissioner Weaver. Yes. Vice Mayor Seidel. Yes. yes. All right. It's only three o'clock, according to the <laughs> clock. <laughs> we weren't here too late, uh, but that brings us to the city uh, commission uh, reports six forty one. Uh, Sarah, I'll I just have a few things I wanted to bring forward, and I, my suggestion is that. Um, 
that some of the things that we ask for in the budget, like those plans, that we might, we might want to add that, I might want you to add that, uh, City Manager Randy, to your city report. Because I want us to be aware of the fact that we're working on this plan. And I don't, I forget about it sometimes and I'll think, where are we on this one? Or where are we on that one? Even if we're not doing anything yet and it hasn't been approved, I think it gives me more of a focus that says, that's what we're headed towards. So, so one of those uh, things, and I think we kind of all had the same response, is when Peter Godfrey sent us a note this past week or so and said, have you done this yet? And I'm like, oh, dang, have we? And so things like that just might be better off put on there. Have we done what he asked? We've submitted all the documentation to the state. Okay. We've asked them for approval of the language, and we're waiting on that approval. That's all that I needed to hear. The other one was that we got a note from somebody who was talking about um, mildew on the sidewalks. Do we have a, and somebody fell, and hey, that's everywhere right now with all the rain. Is, is there any, uh, any, tell me what we're doing with that. It's my understanding that's the property owner's responsibility for making sure the sidewalk's clear in front of their house. It's not, the city doesn't go around washing sidewalks all, our, all around the city. Get that young gentleman who was in here earlier to help us. Okay. Uh, the last thing yeah, is with uh, a cup of water. <laughs> a cup of water I know. Uh, Carolyn and I were both at the um, at the League of Cities meeting, and uh, it was very well done. We were honored to have our governor show up, and he spoke just exactly to the city people, and they uh, he had them all right here because he told them what told us what we wanted to hear. So it was really interesting. And uh, we had quite a few votes, and I know that I, I share what Carolyn can probably go into in further detail, but most of the time when I go to those meetings, I come out of there thinking, wow, we're doing really well in our city. Just, that's how you, that's how you think. So thank you for what you all do and the way we work together. Thank you. All set? Yes, I'm done. Excellent. Commissioner Cooper. Um, the, the first one I was going to talk about for the League of Cities because um, I'm on that transportation policy committee and, I'm sorry. and that is where the discussion of the, uh, the Volkswagen settlement and that $166 million is and, and the criteria is you need to be replacing something that's diesel with something that's an alternative fuel or electric. Um, you need to be in the area that is most impacted by air pollution, which Orlando qualifies. Um, and, and basically, you need to be ready to go. You need to have a plan. You need to have shown some commitment to it. Like an I, electric car plan? Electric car plan. I would really like to see us um, take advantage of some of these grants. And I don't know who writes our grants. You know, we used to have... Do we have somebody doing that stuff? We, we do. Who is it? it uh, Brenda Moody. Oh, perfect. All right. She's a little busy with the library right now, I imagine. Um, but it was it, it was very enlightening. And basically, the the takeaway from it was we have money for water projects, and I know we have. Uh, not move forward with some of our water projects, but perhaps because of the political environment, this might be a time to be thinking about what small project we could get together to move forward. Um, I'd like to see us get some of those funds. Uh, the second item um, is, you know, we talked last meeting, I guess, about accessory structures and non-conforming structures being utilized in the average for establishing lakefront setbacks. And I've been thinking a lot about that, and I just really believe that's not a good direction for us to be moving in. So I don't know what we could do to move that along, but I don't want to wait to some huge overhaul of the, of, of the codes to evaluate it. And I don't pretend to have the right answer. I just, I know math well enough to know what happens if you keep averaging in things that are only 10 foot from the lake. On the other hand, non-conforming structures, um, I think George shared with me that the majority of the homes over around um, Isle of Sicily 
Is, is that, that correct, correct, George? Are, are non-conforming. So if you get to a place where every principal resident is non-conforming, I appreciate that. So I think, in all, all honesty, I think the problem may be more accessory structure than non-conforming structure. You know, but if staff could really look at that, I would appreciate it and make whatever recommendation you see fit. Uh, I know that um, Mr. Schward has been speaking with all of us. Were you going to address that? I know we were waiting for you to look at your packet. Just got my packet. Okay, all right. So we'll have, once you've taken a look at it, we'll decide whether as a commission we are comfortable um, sending a letter to our new or even sitting down and talking to our new postmaster about that. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about was affordable housing. I, I just received something yesterday from a friend of mine that said, I just want you to know that when people talk about the lack of affordable housing in Winter Park, I'm gonna put you on a list and I'm gonna send you every home in Winter Park under $200,000. Um, there were 15 properties on that list that came to me today and some of them were under $150,000. So I just want us to be aware of that and be able to say that to people when they say, what are you doing for affordable housing um, and and I also would like to get three nods from the Commission to ask the uh, staff to come back with some alternative uses of that affordable housing fund um, I know a few years ago I had recommended that perhaps we incentivize the police to live within our jurisdiction I don't know if that's a legal possibility for that fund to at least make that incentive available, or if you would even think it makes sense. But I would love for you to think about what alternatives, maybe we need to buy some of those houses that have back taxes, or I would like to see us do something outside the CRA. I do, I personally don't like the idea of lumping in one small geographic area all of our affordable housing. I would rather see us see what we can do about dispersing it outside the CRA and neighborhoods where some of the homes yeah. need caring for. Commissioner, them. do you have anything a little more specific than just have staff look at what we can do with the extra money? Well, I, I guess probably, Greg, my, my point would be what can't we do? What legally, what constraints are on that pool of money? That's, that's the first thing I'd like to So you'd like to just see those constraints and then, I'd we, like can, to understand then we can maybe that. brainstorm after they bring right. that back. Or have them brainstorm. You know, I just, I just don't like to see a half million dollars sitting there when we have affordable housing needs. You could buy a house in Winter Park for that. Okay. You could? No. I mean, that's it. That's no. It's or, or, we could, or we could help with um, some of the rehabs on, on, in areas where these houses have gone been neglected, perhaps we could buy them and get them off the market and repurpose them as affordable housing within our community. I, I don't want to go building anything. I'm looking at I'm looking at cleaning up what we've got. That's where I'm at. Um, well, you were looking for nods yes. to do something. So you want you want nods to have I would the like staff put together what the current regulations are right. and then what, what the current restrictions and then are. are there properties available that we could purchase and then once they understand the restrictions then, to come back okay. with some recommendations I think I think they have to understand okay. the restrictions too I'm not sure we've Does ever sound, focused on it you know okay. and, I, and I just want to say I'm not interested okay. in building any understood thank you Randy okay. did you follow that yes sir okay thank you uh, number four number four Oh, that, I, that's it. Must be all five. Thank you very much. It's kind of how I treat Steve. That's how she treat me. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I'm used to it. You are doing an excellent job. Thank you. Commissioner Weaver. That was all good stuff, Carolyn. Thank you. Um, so, most every month we have a watershed cleanup and with the exception of the summer months because it's just too darn hot and I'm happy to say that the watershed cleanup around Lake Bell is coming up September 7th and um, we'll be staging in front of my house. You can have barbecue? Yeah, afterwards. If you got to pick up trash to get the barbecue though. And um, I 
been uh, you know an active member with the League of Women Voters, and the other night I went to a um, a conference on plastics and recycling, and um, that group asked me to speak on that on uh, September 26, and that's at the League of Women Voters recycling uh, regular meeting on September 26 at 6:30. Let me make sure that's right. Yeah, at 6.30. And um, from what I've been reading, my ideas about plastic recycling um, was way off base, and I'm anxious to share that with the rest of you. Um, there's a lot of good things going on and a lot of very bad things going on, and I would encourage you to come and listen. There'll be other speakers speaking on it at other venues, but I'll be at Valencia at Winter Park on the 26th. And that's all I have. Thank you. Of course. I'd be hypocritical to say no. <laughs> Since you're not over here, I have to bring you back one time. We all got have gotten a bunch of emails from Winter Park Hills residents this last week for, about their spectrum and about their inability to, to, to get ease. Is there anything we can say or do for those folks? Because I know it's a, a standard email, but I've gotten a ton, so is everybody here, I'm sure. Yeah, I sent a response today telling them where we, we are in the process with our fiber and, and with the invitation to negotiate that we put out. Okay. Uh, and also, I'm forwarding that to the government relations person at Spectrum, just so they know they got a problem, at least in that area, that perhaps as, as Commissioner Seidel said to me today, that an engineering solution might resolve. Okay. Uh, so we're, well, we're working on it. I did, I, co I, did, I copied you. It was, it was late in the day, so you probably didn't see it. Thank you. Yes. All right. Um, I'll go back to the plastics for a minute because it was, uh, I've been trying to use my single use, my non single use plastic cup here, by the way, at the city. But, um, I, I, I dropped my daughter off at school last week, and uh, she's studying marine biology, and that reminded me that she had actually done a science test uh, over at Winter Park High School where she, test, she wanted to see what had more plastic in it, ocean water or, or lake water. And the bad news was that they both had plastic in them. And so I thought that was interesting because you really don't think about our lakes as, as having small bits of plastic floating around, but um, so when we talked about the health of the lakes, that was one of the, the, the items. But the good news was the ocean had more, but that's also bad news, you know what I mean? So that our, our lakes had uh, less. So anyway, um, I just wanted to share that. And, and it's, it's kind of become a, an, an, an interesting topic, if you will, that um, you know, what are we leaving behind? And 400 years from now, we'll be leaving our plastic. So if we can all kind of think about that, I would appreciate that. And, you know, see what the city can do on those, on, on that note. So, um, with that. One last thing. <laughs> Should have known. Thank you right. very much. Uh, this was your first time doing this. Yeah, you did a great job for Thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right, 6.55, adjourn. Thank you.